and gentlemen, let's go. Let's go. We ain't got no time to waste. Let's go. Let's go. You are now listening to Jason Anderson, and you are in the zone. The Zone is presented by Guaranteed Foods, delivering all natural food to Midwestern families since 1958. Enjoy healthier food, more free time, free delivery, and better value. Go to GuaranteedFoods.com. I'm on a Monday edition of The Zone right here on Sports Radio 810 WHB. Jason Anderson with you, Dylan Michaels, Sterling Holmes hanging out with us for the first couple of hours of the show. We've got you for four hours today. Nice change. Four hours today instead of uh, the typical showtime that we have. Uh, we will talk with Josh Kaiser coming up at noon. One Royal Way podcast. Get his thoughts on the weekend that was of the Kansas City Royals. We talked on Friday about the disappointing opening day for the Royals and uh, the 0 and one start 0 and two start after Saturday and offensively not being able to score many runs and then of course yesterday they break out the bats the boys in blue going out there and uh, pummeling the Minnesota Twins and uh, Bailey Ober and uh, getting the uh, the win and now sitting one and two and aggregate scoring they won the series if you ask me I mean they're plus four why don't we do that more in Major League Baseball, but uh, uh, aggregate scoring, they have won the series. Uh, plus four on the season, the Royals are uh, in run differential. But uh, we'll talk some Royals today, certainly with Josh Kaiser, but other points in the show as well. Mick Schaefer will hang out with him coming up at 1 o'clock, KSHB 41 Sports Director. We get some Learn Funniest Best with Mick Schaefer. We'll also eliminate teams in the bracket of sound. We are now down to four. And then there were four teams in the NCAA tournament remaining, you've got UConn taking on Bama, and you got NC State and Purdue. So uh, two ones, a four, and an 11. So out of all of the sort of chalk and the one and twos that made it to the Sweet 16 and the, well, you know, we haven't, um, you know, we haven't seen some of those crazy upsets, those bigger seeds, and you get two number one seeds there. Zero twos, zero threes. You get a four and an 11 with NC State. And you have the two teams with the longest winning streak in college basketball, In uh, which you know makes sense considering there's only four teams left. But you've got UConn that have won 11 games in a row. And you've got North Carolina State that has won nine straight games. Nine straight games. And how amazing and improbable this NC State run is in that looking back to that Virginia game in the ACC tournament when Virginia was leading by six with like 40 seconds to go and they couldn't hit a free throw and then they were leading by three with six seconds to go and a one-in-one opportunity Virginia at the free throw line and they missed the front end and NC State comes down and chucks up an NBA three that banks home and they go to overtime. And they win that game. And now they're in the final four. <laughs> if a free throw is made or a three-pointer does not bank in or they don't win an overtime in that particular game. And then the next game and the next game and the next game and the next game and the next game. And they are sitting here in one of the more improbable runs for a team in NC State that didn't look like a tournament team most of the season and is now two wins away from playing for a national championship. And we get to see a fun matchup in Zach Eady and, and uh, DJ Burns. I'm, I'm not sure DJ Burns is going to be able to just, uh, you know, uh, back dudes down into the post when one of those dudes is going to be Zach Eady. Um, but it certainly feels like there's a collision course with UConn and Purdue, and we will see Zach Eady and, and, uh, and uh, Kling Kong in the, uh, in the matchup on Monday night. I think that's what will be the case. But the last three games, I've thought the opposition was going to beat NC State. <laughs> in fact, my wallet was saying the opposition was going to beat <laughs> NC State. And uh, my wallet has not um, been the uh, beneficiary of NC State's run. So it's, uh, it, it's an improbable spot for them to be in. And uh, Alabama hires Nate Oates a number of years ago, and now they are playing for a Final Four uh, their first ever Final Four. Glad to see a team uh, uh, make a uh, a Final Four in their um, in their school's history. I'm happy for them. 
I'm glad to see a team finally get over the hump and get to a Final Four. What? I'm just saying it's ha I'm happy to see a team that has been to a number of tournaments that has never been to a Final Four, that has never won four games in a row, that the farthest they have uh, achieved in a tournament is winning three games and getting to the Elite Eight, but losing every single time they've been in the Elite Eight. It's cool to see a team and a program do that, especially one that does not have success in any other sport. And that's big of you. I, you. I wanted to say that. That's very big of you, Jason. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I really respect that. Yeah, there's no jealousy. There's no envy. There is none of that going on at all. It's just pure appreciation for the joy of the sport and a program that has been downtrodden in every other sport at that spot to finally have a little bit of success for their fans while they pass the time to get ready for spring football. <laughs> all right, there there was the salt. I apologize. I apologize about that. I was, I was feeling really good up until then. Uh, but then you get to the uh, apologize about the uh, passing the time with basketball so you can get to spring football. But basketball school now for Alabama. Nick Saban retires, basketball school. That's all it took. Nick, Alabama was never going to go to the Final Four as long as uh, Nick Saban had a say mm, in it. It, it, was just, it was a deal they signed. Yep. Alabama signed a deal where if Nick Saban's the, the head coach, you'll do great in football, but you're not allowed to make a no. Final Four. What has what Mizzou signed? They had to sign something that, that – makes it so they can't make a Final Four, and they have to play zone against Princeton. I, I, I don't know the rules. They um, they weren't smart enough, and they signed something that they did not read the fine print. <laughs> that just The fine print just said, <laughs> you fools. That was it. That was the fine print. <laughs> you idiots. Um, no, they signed it to win the baseball national championship in the 1950s with Norm Stewart at second base. Mm. Like, you know what? If we can just win this one, it doesn't matter anything else in the future because baseball school and winning a baseball – championship is really all that matters right now um, I would like to go back there and ha and rip up that contract before uh, they did that so don't it doesn't seem worth it but whatever congratulations Alabama uh, Purdue getting back to the final four NC State making another Jimmy V run uh, an NC State run it's funny the Cinderella the survive in advance that started it all with Jimmy V and NC State and now we're looking at it again that same team that sort of survive in advance and anything is possible. You're not making the tournament. Okay, you got to win. Kevin Garnett. Yeah, you, you, you're darn right. Anything is possible. Uh, five games in five days in the ACC tournament. And the last time we saw somebody do this was UConn. Mm. UConn won five games in five days in the Big East tournament. And then they went on to win the national championship. I'm not saying that's going to be the case with NC State, mm. but the last time we saw a team go five games, five days, then went to the Final Four. So, next time there is a team that wins five games in five days to win their, their conference tournament, I will put that team in the Final Four on principle alone, unless it's Missouri. And that'll be the year that they get bounced round one. Unless yeah. it's Missouri. Yeah. <laughs> no, I put Missouri in the Final Four every year. Why not? Even you know? this year, right? Even this year. You, you, it's a write-in vote. It's a write-in. It's like Mickey yeah. Mouse for president. Write-in vote. Come on. Uh, Sterling Holmes hanging out with us. Uh, we'll talk some college basketball throughout the show. Um, we'll certainly talk some uh, Royals baseball as well. Uh, I do want to get into and discuss, well, one thing, um, make sure you're aware of the things you're reading online. And it is interesting that, you know, today is the day that people actually go, oh, it's on the internet. I better double check. <laughs> I better, it's a tweet. Let me double check the tweet before. I really believe what's being said here, as opposed to any other time. Uh, Justin Reed announced his retirement today. And he says it's not an April Fool's. No, obviously it's an April Fool's. Uh, Justin Reed tweeted out uh, at 8.30, For the last four years or so, I've been in the cycle on injury, pain, rehab. I've felt stuck in it. The only way I see out is to no longer play football. I've taken, It's taken my joy of this game away. Thank you, everyone. That's uh, supported me on this incredible journey. I love you all. So uh, Justin Reed is retired. Um, if it were April 2nd or March 31st, but it's uh, April Fool's Day, so Justin Reed has not retired. Um, I'll see it when I believe it, okay? Justin Reed. Do you also hate April Fool's? Like I, I, I'm I not just, a fan of it. I, I, when you're a kid, it's funny, right? Because those yeah. dumb jokes make you laugh. Yeah, because a, a lot of dumb things make you laugh as a child. You get older and you're like... Maybe I'm a curmudgeon now. I was no. like, stop it. Stop trying to fool me. Don't fool me. 
No, I just uh, I, I'm with you. I don't I don't need to uh, April Fools. You know, it's, it's, he's retiring. No, he's not. I mean, come on. Um, so yeah, nine one three nine one two four eight ten is the uh, text line. Nine one three nine one two four eight ten to uh, join us today to be a part of the show. Um, 913-912-4810. Let's get the uh, latest on Rasheed Rice. So the latest on Rasheed Rice, as I would guess, most everybody listening has probably heard of the details of what's going on. The latest is that he has retained counsel. Don't any, uh, know any more than that. Mark Donovan has weighed in in an interview that he was doing about the vote tomorrow and said that they are aware of the situation. They will continue to collect information as much as possible, and they will handle it accordingly when the information is in. The expected... Um, That's copy-paste, man. Yeah, like, absolutely. How, how many people have that just, no, just copied it somewhere? Absolutely like, is. Yeah. It absolutely is. Um, and it's expected copy and paste for a statement from an, an organization and a team with what's going on. I don't know any more than that. The video looks pretty bad. I mean, it's a relative term. It is not, thank goodness, it's not a Henry Rugg situation. That was just tragic and awful what took place. And it was, it's expected Twitter yesterday when Rasheed Rice is trending with Henry Ruggs. I mean, it's just. You, you know that's going to be the lowest common denominator yeah. that's out there. And people are, you know, uh, sprinting to Twitter to get their jokes off, right? Um, young people make stupid decisions all the time. And it is not to excuse it. It is just simply to say that young people make dumb decisions all the time. And young people drive fast in cars all the time and make dumb decisions. We don't know if this is a road rage incident or this was just street racing. You had a Lamborghini and you had a Corvette. And you had Rasheed Rice in his Corvette, allegedly. Rasheed Rice in the Corvette, whether he was driving or not. Rasheed Rice in the Corvette, driving in the left lane. And you had a Lamborghini that was passing the Corvette and another car um, in the, um, uh, on the shoulder collided with another car that was in the left lane, and then the ricochet took place. The issue was not just simply the fact that you were speeding and going at a high rate, which caused, you know, a, a six-car crash, which caused injuries to where people went to the hospital for it, whether minor or serious, people went to the hospital for it. It's also then compounding that by leaving the scene. Both groups, the Lamborghini and the Corvette, just left the scene and left the cars there. And again, these are young people making dumb decisions. Not excusing it because they will be held accountable. When the information comes out, when we find out if Rasheed Rice was driving, if uh, somebody else was driving, if there was something else as to the reason why they left the scene, whether it was blood alcohol content or to take something out of the car that was there that they didn't want to be found, whatever it might be, both groups left the scene, compounding the issue that's there. I think we've all learned a lesson from Tyreek Hill five years ago of try to let as much be known before really getting into hot takes about this yes. or that or this or that. There will be some sort of, if it was Rasheed Rice and he was driving or even there and, you know, left the scene. All indications certainly seem that way by the video. Certainly looks like Rasheed Rice. Um, there will be some sort of a punishment, some sort of a penalty that would be handed down, whether that be games or, you know, whatever it might be, or, or a fine. There will certainly be monetary implications with lawsuits and things like that that will take place. But we learned a lesson five years ago about, you know, let's, as much as we can, let the information get out there before having some hot takes about it. And certainly we will do that on this show. We will let the facts come out. 
it's not a good look. And it's a difficult position that the Chiefs are in now in an unknown that's happening the month of the draft. Yeah. And the Chiefs have been in this position before. He's almost 24, mm-hmm. and we're going to let everything play out because I hate the jumping to conclusions when, again, you have no idea. My main takeaway, though, is, again, putting yourself in a position like this is never a good idea. Like, I understand your thought of, you know, he's young, young yeah. makes stupid mistakes. You're almost 24. You're 24 in, in, in 21 yeah. days. You're not that young anymore. Like, at some point, this is not you're 18 years old, you're cracking a beer, senior year of high school, and the cops come and you're trying to run away. Like, that's okay. Mm-hmm. I get it. We, we've not all been there, but that's a common thing. Mm-hmm. This does not seem like a common thing. I've never done anything remotely like this. Again, we're not saying Rasheed Rice did or did not do this, but allegedly. Well, I've sped on the highway. I've gone too fast on the highway. Have you been racing someone on the highway? Have you been? Have you been like, like no, I don't understand a, that no, thought but, process. Like, no, but, I get going eighty in a seventy. No, but there was a time when you know I had a car that could go quicker than I should have had it driving and <laughs> upset at somebody on the highway and you get into that sort of yeah and it was dumb and I was in my you know 20s sure and I look back and I'm like that was really stupid that I- was really dumb and something bad could have happened you know by the grace of God go I right I mean yeah. it did not happen and here I am but something very easily could have happened we see it all the time um we are not immortal, but there is certainly a feeling of that when you are younger. How about that? Sure. Younger. When you're still in your 20s. I mean, come on. The guy's a millionaire. Uh, the guy has just won a Super Bowl. And you probably feel like you're on top of the world. And you can do really anything. And that comes crashing down pretty quickly with lessons like this. Um, and his lesson seemed, may have been, hopefully, would be learned without tragedy yeah. that took place. I guess... For me, yeah. my 1994 Toyota RAV4 was not out <laughs> driving anyone, my first car. So I, I think that that may be an issue of I could only get up to 60, so I wasn't yeah. going to be going past anyone. That, And then I've had, I've had Jeeps. I've never had a, a fast car, I guess, mm-hmm. and that's where I'm yeah. from. I've, I've never had that. I have to show this dude that I, my car is faster. Like, like It's I, dumb. I don't know. It's dumb. It's not something to be proud of, certainly. I would I, I would be glad that there's not video of, of those things, but it's happened, and I have no problem admitting that it's happened when I was in my 20s, and it was absolutely stupid. And I've learned from that. Yeah. And, by the way, growing up, having a career, having a family – and kids, like those things are really dumb. Calm. You know, those things are those things are really stupid, right? I mean, it's like you know, like oh, I'm gonna get in a fight on Twitter. Let's fight. Like I'm not trying to fight you. I'm trying to grow grass in my front yard, man. I'm trying to I'm trying to make sure that the uh, the was... tomatoes grow correct. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make sure that the house stays clean. The kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing, and the damn tomatoes don't get eaten by the squirrels. That's what's going on in my life right now. And getting my son's swing on track. That's it. That's those are the things that, are, that I'm dealing with right now. D- Dylan said he was planting some, what, chrysanthemums? Azaleas? What, what were you planting, Dylan, before the show? You got perennials, man? Uh, the hostas. Oh, the hostas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah got the, got the ho- we had some hostas until the uh, rabbits uh, ate all of yes, them, that's destroyed the them, which, whatever, as long as they don't touch my tomatoes. Yeah, I have a basset <laughs> hound, so he's not one to be chasing the rabbits out of the yard. I so see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I've gotten him a squirrel, like yeah. one of those plush squirrels, to hopefully train him. But that, yeah. <laughs> just pulling the squirrel yeah. on a string, you yeah. know. Oh, yeah. Then he gets it, and rips it apart. Yeah, it doesn't really work at eight years old for basset hounds, but yeah. <laughs> he looks too fast. He just looks hungry. All right, I chased him here for ten feet. That's enough. Rough. Yeah, that's that is his <laughs> voice. I love you sound like Rudy <laughs> right now. <laughs> Huh. He's not moving. He's not moving. Add another impression to the bag there. There you go. There you go. And then you got the small little dog that's like, come on, man. Come on. Come on. I'll take him. Burr, burr, burr. Yep. <laughs> come on. Calm down, little guy. It's okay. You'll get older. You'll realize when you're 72 like me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth it. My dog was 72 at age two. So. <laughs> that's right. He's always been 72. That's right. Uh, yeah, I mean, but again, uh, there are some uh, dumb things that happen. And look, Sterling, you're right. 
He's 24 years old. He's not 15. He's not 16. He's not 17. Um, he is a professional. And even 30 and 40 year olds do dumb things. The excuse is not written in. A, well, he's young. He makes a makes yeah. a, a dumb decision. I think young people, younger people, do this stuff all the time, and. It's not to be excused. It's to hope that there's a lesson that does not come with tragedy. And certainly there, is, there are victims in this because there are people that are heading to the hospital. There are people who will be on the highway now that are driving differently or at least scared. You know, when you're in a car accident, it's scary as heck. And it changes your perspective when you're driving around until you get used to it a little bit. But just out of nowhere, all of a sudden your car gets hit from behind and you're spinning and you're crashing and you had nothing to do with that. You're just simply going about your day. There are victims in this that took place. So it is not excusable of, oh, he's just going fast. He didn't get a ticket of going 80 in a 45. That's dumb. Yeah. He allegedly, part of this racing, road rage, whatever, caused a... A huge wreck, and then allegedly, if he's a part of it, left the scene. And he'll have to pay the consequences. I don't know what those consequences will be, but he will have to do that. The Chiefs will have to make the decision what those consequences are, and they will have to make the decision of how to move forward with Rasheed Rice. And if it's something that now changes your strategy in the draft. I have no idea if it does, but we've seen that before. Those were certainly more serious allegations that were going on with somebody that had a history of allegations that were going on and a potential of never playing in the NFL again and needing to find something that could take that spot. We are not that level with Rasheed Rice, even if there is some sort of a punishment, a couple of games, three games, yeah. four games, whatever it might be. Um, it is not career ending here. Luckily for him, it's not career-ending. We'll take a timeout. We'll come back. We'll continue rolling. We will um, uh, get into some Royals. We'll get into some college basketball. Uh, we'll get into uh, <laughs> Kent Babb v. Kim Mulkey. <laughs> I love me some Kent Babb, man. Love me some Kent Babb. Uh, we'll take a timeout. We'll come back. We'll continue rolling. More Zone right after this. All right, we will continue rolling. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Dylan. <laughs> and go. And go. Uh, well, you know what? You might be uh, going to check out your roof very soon with the weather that is going to be coming into town. We know that, whether that be the tornadoes or hail or high wind. There have been a number of people driving around the neighborhood, uh, seeing a number of houses that are getting new roofs. And if you are wondering if your house would need a new roof, maybe some cosmetic issues, maybe some issues that are going on, that very soon you're going to be in the market for a new roof. Give Pyramid Roofing a call for a free estimate, 816-966-1101. You can check them out, pyramidroofingkc.com, and see all of the things that they can do for you. We needed new gutters on our house. We're going to need a new roof eventually, but we needed new gutters on our house with the roof line, and the gutters were not big enough to be able to handle the water runoff. And so we got, uh, you know, bigger gutters, got bigger uh, downspouts, and that was with uh, Pyramid Roofing, and they did a fantastic job. And we know soon we'll be in the market for a new roof because they were up on the roof and they looked at it and they said, all right, here's some issues that are there. You don't need anything right now. It is not a, a desperate situation. You've got a little bit of time. But if there is another storm that comes through or a high wind storm or whatever it might be, you're probably going to be looking at, you know, needing us to come back out here and give it a give it a look, which we will do. Uh, and the people we will call is Pyramid Roofing, 816-966-1101. You can check them out, pyramidroofingkc.com.
Sterling Holmes hanging out with us. We'll talk with Josh Kaiser coming up, One Royal Way podcast at noon, and get his thoughts on the Kansas City Royals and winning the game yesterday, not getting swept. Damn it. They're back. All right? They're so back, This dude. is different. All right? Come on. They didn't get swept. They didn't win the series, but they are plus four and run differential, damn it. All right? You will take this team seriously. No, all joking aside, here's Matt Quattrero. Let's hear from him uh, in the post game talking about uh, Bobby Witt and uh, Brady Singer and getting at least one win in this series to get the season started. Bobby's the one that his swing is the one that kind of started it for me. Like, he got on top of that fastball for the base hit. Then he worked a good at bat. Salvi laid off a couple pitches out of his own, and then I believe that was a changeup that he hit for the home run. And, you know, that shows his power. You know, obviously we know he has power, but that was – to get out to a lead today was, was nice, you know, based on how we had not scored the last two days. Just looking at your starting pitching, Brady Singer looked like another strong start. What do you see out of him? Well, he commanded the ball. I mean, when you're getting, when he's getting quick outs, you know, a six pitch first, and they made him work a little bit in the second there, get up to 30 pitches. But a couple, the third inning was quick again. When he's getting quick outs and they're ground balls, that's really encouraging. He's commanding the fastball. He used both the four and the two, um, and his slider was getting swing and miss. You're optimistic about the pitching staff coming in, but you see three straight quality starts. To see it come to action, how's that make you feel? Like? Yeah, I mean, it's a great feeling, and the team is going to feed off of that. You know, if you, that's a good team in the other clubhouse, and to be able to to hold down their offense with the starting pitching, that was very encouraging. How do you assess the first series? Yeah, I mean, starting pitching, we got three great starts. You know, they had two really good starts the last two days, and those games can go either way, right? They they beat us the the last two days, and fortunately for us, it was it was a little payback today. And you know, it's good. It's way better to get out of here with a win than than being swept. Agreed. Agreed. Um, here's what's different to me about the opening series and and what, you know, would be like, oh, same old, same old, same old Royals. Yeah, they, they had one game that looked good and, you know, they score 11 runs in one game. But when it was crunch time, when it was 2-1, when it was one nothing, they couldn't figure out a way to get any runs. But then you're just a landslide and everybody's just having fun and it's easy then. Okay. Here's the difference. Last year, we talked about March and April and they started out 7-22. and they also had already suffered at the end of April a seven-game losing streak. And what is different this year, and it's one of the things I talked about, and we had said, I don't know how good the offense is going to be. I hope Vinny Pasquantino is healthy. I think Bobby Witt is a stud, obviously. Uh, I don't know what Nelson Velasquez is going to be. It was nice to see him have his smooth, easy swing that he crushed 400 because <laughs> he's just got, like, ridiculous natural power. Um, and it was good to see Salvi, obviously, and, and Garcia get another one and Isbell get a hold of one. Like, yeah, it was nice yesterday to see this team come through and score 11 runs. But the difference this year to me is that at least four times, and I don't know what Alec Marsh is going to be, but four out of five times, you feel like you got a chance to win that game. And in three games so far, three games, three starts, the Royals starters, 19 innings, two earned runs, 23 strikeouts, 15 total base runners in that time. That's a .94 ERA, a .789 whip, and again, 23 Ks in 19 innings. Two earned runs total, and those two earned runs were Cole Reagan's. <laughs> <laughs> that scrub, right? The ace of the staff. Yeah. And here's the thing. If you said, you know, those first three starts – like, all right, well, what did Michael Waka do? He hadn't started. We'll see him tonight against Baltimore. So that's different, is that that's how you stop a losing streak. But when you've got Jordan Lyles and, and you know, the remnants of Zach Greinke, unfortunately, and Brady Singer that was figuring it out at the in real time, and Daniel Lynch and Bubich and whoever, that's how you go and lose a game and then lose a game and lose a game and lose a game. They don't have that quote-unquote stopper. Yeah. As a uh, pitcher, well, again, I think the Royals, four times out of five, will have somebody on the mound that you got a chance to win that night. And if you give them enough run support, you can win that game. We'll see about the bullpen, because both times the bullpen's been in there when it's been uh, clutch situations, they've given up runs. 
and whoever it is, even Will Smith, yeah. got hit around uh, on Saturday. We've um, you know seen a Stratton get to hit around, or at least have some runs come and score with a pass ball, um, uh, you know, a slow roller to short. Another one that looked like it hit Carlos Correa's uh, left foot. Um, yeah. You know, that that was maybe it was unfortunate, maybe it was unlucky. But that's different this go-around. We can talk about the offense busting out yesterday, and we'll see if that carries over. But what has happened so far, Sterling, to start the season is one of the things that was viewed as a strength of this Royals, and they've actually seen it as a strength in three games. Yeah, this is what I love to see, because you're in every single game. I went into this year saying, okay, the starting pitching's great. Bullpen, I've actually thought solid. I, I, I know it's a very small sample size, and we've already had some people make their decisions that this bullpen's atrocious. <laughs> Let's calm down now. We, we can't be that excited going into the year. And after uh, basically only two games where we actually saw him this mm-hmm. past game, I, I'm not going to take much from Jordan Lyles uh, in mop-up duty. Sorry. He got a clean inning, damn it. Two strikeouts, too. Well, maybe not he's, a clean uh, inning. He walked a guy. Yeah. That's right. He's, yeah. he's Ho Chaver now. He, he's Wade Davis <laughs> now going starter to bullpen. All of a sudden, he's damn electric. Right. Yeah. yeah. But but you're in every single game. The offense, I have issues because, you know, from one to four, I think you feel pretty good about. It's the five through nine where there's a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. Again, they're not all answered after one offensive explosion, but when you have Bobby Witt Jr. looking like a legitimate superstar, I'm not talking a great player. I'm not talking, uh, you know, Eric Hosmer, what he did. I'm, I'm talking more in the Mike Trouts, the Juan Sotos, the Ronald Acuna Juniors. When Bobby Witt Jr. is looking like that, now, I don't think he's going to slash an, uh, uh, sorry, an OPS of nearly 2,000. All season long. I don't know why you hate Seems Bobby a little, Jr. Seems a little unsustainable. But when you actually see Michael Garcia work on his launch angle because he was a very good um, hard-hit ball rate last year, but he was sitting on the ground. He's what? hit um, so far in 12 plate appearances. He has hit half the home runs this year that he hit last year in 515 plate appearances. <laughs> 515 plate appearances, four home runs. He's hit two already. But I don't think it's a fluke with him. I don't either. Because, because again, last year all we said was, wow, look at how hard he's hitting the ball mm-hmm. and all the analytics back it up. It's can he just get it elevated? And, again, small sample size, but so far he has. And we saw it in the um, – what what league was he in uh, before he, he, he went to spring training? He, he was playing the, the uh, Dominican League. Or the Venezuelan League. The Venezuelan League, one, one of those. And, and he was just raking. And everyone's – he has his launch angle figured out. It's great. Um, Salvador yeah, Perez a took a Venezuelan winter league. He took a, a, a breaking ball change up slider, whatever it was on the painted the black by Ober. When I saw that pitch, I go, that's a great pitch. It was low and outside on the corner and Salvi somehow pulls it for a three run shot. Mm-hmm. Okay. Again, I, I don't know what Salvi's going to be this year at this age, but if he's continually going to hit 25 home runs, bat around 260, we know he's not going to take any walks. You're fine there. And then MJ Melendez is hitting the ball so hard right now. I mean, I, I, I'm just very excited by the process. The runs mm-hmm. did not happen in the first two games. They did not at all. It was not happy. I was, I was, I was not thrilled by that. But, but some of the process of, of MJ Melendez hitting the ball hard, mm-hmm. of Kyle Isabel making great contact, who I think is an underrated piece, who I'm not high on Kyle Isabel. If you ever listened to me before, not my guy. But give credit where credit's due. Yeah. He, he looks like his swing looks more compact. And he's hitting the ball harder. I, I, I've been excited by the process, even if the results are still one and two. Yeah, it's three games, and um, hopefully Garcia. Well, you know what? I'll 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 change that. I hope Garcia ends up every single hit as a home run at the end of the year. That would be awesome for him. Um, you know, because right now he's uh, two hits, two home runs. He's gotten on base twice, and he's never actually stood on base. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the two times he's been on, he's just. Ran around the bases and got yeah. to uh, go right back to the dugout uh, so far. He's uh, two hits and uh, 12 at-bats, both of them being home runs. Um, I, you know, I don't need a, a Joey Gallo, a strikeout, or a, a home run to start uh, to, to be the guy who's a leadoff hitter. But again, if he ends up with every single hit this year being a home run, then I think he's going to break the record for home runs in a season. Bold take. I, 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 I just think that's the case. I mean, the guy had, you know, over 100 hits last year. <laughs> and, and so far, he's pacing for over 100 hits this year. He's on pace to hit a lot of home runs this year with two of every three games, you know. Uh, but again, he's hitting the ball hard. And you're right. The launch angle that, um, you know, clearly has been worked on, that's awesome. 
two months from now, he might only have two home runs. Sure. You know, we've seen those things happen before. Kyle Isbell may end up with one home run over the first half of the season because uh, he's also not a home run hitter. But he got a hold of that one. Um, we know Salvi's going to do that. We know Bobby Witt's going to do that. I think there's a cycle in the near future for Bobby Witt. I mean, it's unfortunate last night or yesterday he didn't get that. Two different at-bats. But the triple is the toughest one. And the guy's going to have triples this year. And you know he can hit home runs. And he can stretch singles into doubles. Like, if there's – he's the player that will finally break the George Brett drought, the Royals drought of (laughs) George Brett being the last one to hit the cycle and still the longest drought of any Major League Baseball team right now of not having a player hit for the cycle. I think Bobby Witt will be the guy that breaks it. He was a double shy in the third inning because he went went single – was it single, triple home run? Yep. I mean, it's crazy. And you're like, look, this guy's going to get a double. Uh, let's hear from Bobby Witt, actually, post game, uh, talking about the uh, offensive output, the potential cycle uh, that was there for him in a couple of at bats. Here's Bobby Witt uh, yesterday after the game. Yeah, we knew what we were capable of. We knew this was there. It just had to just kind of click. And so we kind of started, get, got us going. And so it was, it's great to see. Just shows everyone what this offense can do. And it's just, it's just kind of getting started. Uh, looking for the double in the, in the last two at bats? Um, yeah, I didn't want to try to put too much pressure on myself, but I got a couple pitches that I should have hit, and so, yeah. After kind of struggling offensively in the first two, what did it mean to have a big offensive explosion in this one for you? Yeah, it's it's huge, and it's just, I think it was everyone had maybe six, seven at bats, so it's like, I don't know if you call it really struggling the first two games, it's just, just not getting the hits, and so it's just kind of, you can't really control that, so you can, can control what you can control here, and Got some runs on the board, and our pitching is what it is, and so it's going to be a lot of fun this year. What did you think of Brady today? It was, it was electric, just him throwing all the pitches, do- pounding the zone, and just kind of dominating, and he was just, it was just incredible to see this vintage Brady Singer pitch. Did it mean something to you guys to really help out your starting pitcher after they gave you two good starts yesterday the last two games? Yeah, definitely. I even told uh, uh, Brian Sweeney yesterday after the game, I'm like, we'll get you some runs. I promise that, so yeah. You know, um, music in the background, we should probably make that like every single soundbite in the clubhouse because there's only music in wins. So you know it was a good – if you just simply play a player in the clubhouse post game, play the clip, you know if they won or lost, not necessarily by the tone of their voice. That's pretty easy too. But also if there's music in the background. Because you play music after a win. No music after a loss. When you hear 303, you know that's Is that's that right? a win. That, 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 that's, that's a win. Dylan I was and I were cracking gonna say, up. do you know if you won or lost if you hear 303? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's – the early – What, the what about goosebumps? 10? I get those goosebumps every uh, – I was like, uh, if you uh, lose, uh, you play Johnny, Johnny Cash Hurt. I guess you could, you could actually go with the original if you wanted to go with yeah. Nine Inch Nails, but – no, you played Temptations. I wish it would rain. <laughs> <laughs> Sunshine, blue skies. Do you think he Please was? Please go away. Do you think he was trying a little, little hard for that double? Because I, I, I did. One oh, of, absolutely. What, what, yes, it was on his mind. Th- that, that strike. I'm like, man, you were not going to swing at that pitch earlier in the game. I guarantee you, you're, you're taking that slider low and away. You're not swinging. I know you're not. No, absolutely. And then the, you know, fastball right down the middle that he swings <laughs> through, and he's just like, oh, he was so mad at himself, which makes sense. Um, I really thought he was going to get it. I, I, I thought he was going to – he's going to hit a single, and the guy's going to go for two. Yeah. He's going he's gonna to get to second base in, you know, seven seconds, you know, fastest in Major League Baseball. He and uh, Ellie De La Cruz, you know, getting from uh, home to second base, he's, he's going to do it. Uh, but, I, but I do think – He's going to do it, you know what, this year. There you go. There's a there's a crazy prediction. This year he's going to hit for the cycle. It hasn't happened in, you know, 30 years, 33, 34 years. I want to give him more credit, though, just very quickly. So you say because- what, this week? Today? You're saying the cycle today. <laughs> Sterling Holmes is guaranteed Bobby Witt Jr. will hit for the cycle today. Wow. Good I you. think his defensive improvement from a rookie to now oh, is yeah. maybe the most – jarring in a good way some of the plays he's made already uh, blown my mind Carlos Correa has a great arm by the way he's made a couple great plays at shortstop Mm -hmm. Bobby Witt Jr. has made it look even easier and I think Carlos Correa has one of the best arms he's not he's not the best fielder but great arm Bobby Witt Jr. is just humming the ball over there not not a one hop not 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 trying to give Vinny a, a tough pick or Salvi 
Yeah. I mean, Bobby Witt Jr. has been electric defensively, and I think that maybe is the most underrated aspect of his game at this point. You're not supposed to be the guy on a baseball field that just everything you do, you look like the 12-year-old on your team that's just like, yeah, that guy's there. That that kid is uh, is really, really good. I mean, look at the way he's picking it at shortstop. Uh, that guy's crushing it. Oh, they're bringing him into pitch, too. Like, that guy's just a little, oh, wow, he's catching uh, this inning. You know, that guy's different, right? You just see that. Like, you're not supposed to do that and be that on a baseball field as a guy who's yet to turn 24 years old, still a 23-year-old, that you're like, oh, that guy's just different. Yeah, that guy's just different at the plate, on the base paths, defensively, arm, power, speed, leading the league in batting average. Ah, he's just uh, he's just different. With uh, with uh, Mookie Betts going 0 for 4 last night, yeah. you got Bobby Witt that's uh, leading Major League Baseball in batting average right now. Stop the press. I mean, stop the count right now. There you go. Stop the count. Uh, he's uh, leading Major League Base. We got a, a batting title here. Uh, first one since uh, you know George Brett. Let's do it. Um, but yeah, he, he just. It's different. On the field, he just looks like he's ahead of the class in each subject. <laughs> no matter what it is, he's just that good. We'll take a timeout. We'll come back. And thank goodness they've already got him signed and they yes. got that contract to him. <laughs> thank goodness he agreed to that deal, too. So good on Bobby. Uh, we'll take a timeout. We'll come back. Continue rolling more zone next.
college basketball coming up in the 11 o'clock hour. We'll talk some Royals with Josh Kaiser. One Royal Way podcast coming up at noon. Mick Schaefer at 1 o'clock. Some learn funniest best. The bracket of sound will be eliminating teams. Uh, and we'll continue with uh, more conversation. Certainly, um, if there's any updates with Rasheed Rice, we will pass those along. Uh, right now, a little bit of a holding pattern with him. Um, having uh, counsel now, attaining counsel, and uh, that report coming from uh, Josina Anderson yesterday, what, late afternoon, early evening. Um, so that's the latest with Rasheed Rice. We'll talk some college basketball on the other side. UConn just simply dominant. Purdue beating teams and Rick Barn complaining about um, officiating. He's big.
The Zone is presented by Guarantee Foods, delivering all natural food to Midwestern families since 1958. Enjoy healthier food, more free time, free delivery, and better value. Go to GuaranteedFoods.com. Continue right here on Sports Radio 810 WHB. Jason Anderson with you. Sterling Holmes hanging out with us. Dylan Michaels until 2 o'clock. We've got uh, Josh Kaiser coming up at noon. One Royal Way podcast. We'll continue talking some uh, Royals baseball with him. Uh, UConn continues their just incredibly dominant run. Uh, They win by 25 points over Illinois. And one of the most incredible things that I've watched in the NCAA tournament, and not just this year. And typically it's not great because you want to see good games, you want to see close games, you want to see drama in a game. But to watch a team be tied at 23 and then they're down 30! (laughs) I have never seen something like that before in the NCAA tournament. I think it was at a Mizzou game in like 98, 99 when they went on a 30 nothing run against Colorado. Um, it's a true story. Um, I think it was something like that. It was, it was some improbable, incredible, ridiculous um, run that uh, Mizzou went on, and even more improbable because it was Mizzou uh, <laughs> and not UConn and just the dominance that they have. I've never seen anything like that when it's an Elite Eight game against the number 10 team in the land. Illinois, AP ranked number 10 team in the land with Terrence Shannon over there, a damn fine coach in Brad Underwood, other good players on the uh, on the court for Illinois, and UConn just systematically dismantles them, just piece by piece tearing them apart like a like a a, a rag doll and a and a dog. It's like Dylan's dog and the pet and the uh the the, the toy rabbit just ripping it apart piece by piece on a 30 to nothing run. And I thought for a second, I was like, I wonder if this is a game that's going to be close. You know, yeah. the, the, the widest or the closest game that UConn has played in these now nine games in the tournament, um, 10 games in the tournament, I should say, because they played four this year, six last year. So 10 games in the tournament has been a 13 point win over Arkansas last year in the elite eight. It's the closest game they played. What was it? Sweet 16. Doesn't matter. Closest game they played. This year. And yet another team out of the 10. Another team didn't reach 60 points. (laughs) Eight out of 10 games. Eight, 10. Eight out of 10 games that UConn has played in the tournament the last two years. A team has failed to reach 60 points. Only twice a team has reached 60 points. Iona and Arkansas. Iona was the first game of last year's tournament. Arkansas was the third game of last year's tournament. That means there are seven consecutive games that UConn has played in the NCAA tournament in which a team has not got to 60, and yet they are hanging out with the 80s. (laughs) They are just kicking it with the 80-year-olds. What's so impressive to me, they didn't necessarily have a great game. Like, they went on that great run, but but it's not like you're seeing a guy put up. It wasn't Connect who put up 40. Outside of the 30-0 run, they lost by five. No, I no, mean, no, that, that's not my no, point. That's, but, but I'm, I'm joking along with you, though. Yeah, they're, they're just so balanced. And, like, again, Newton, who averages over 15 a game, had five. Yeah. He was 0 of 6 from the field. Like, it's a 15-point <laughs> score who, was, who had five points. Castle, who's a double-digit scorer, was 1 of 6. He had two points. Cam Spencer only had 11. Yeah. Like, we're just sitting here. And I'm like, they're just balanced, man. You know, Klingon had 22. He, he, he's grown so much. Points or blocks? <laughs> yeah, good yes. call. Uh, yes. Yes. But he's grown so much as a player, as an athlete. As a person, as a human. Because he's very big as well. Yeah, he's, he's large. He's a you large know, Caravan being. had 10. Like, they're, they're, they're just so 
well balanced. You take one guy away, someone else is going to beat you. But again, that should terrify you if you are mm -hmm. any other team. Not only are they just dismantling teams, they do it so many ways. And it, then you look at the box score, and you're like, yeah, they didn't really shoot very, very well. Three of 17 from three. They won by 25 and shooting horrendously from the three-point line. Like, that to me is so impressive. They don't turn the ball over, only nine turnovers. You mentioned defensively, they're just phenomenal. Um, they just beat you so many different ways. Brad Underwood. <clears throat> Go ahead, Dylan. I was going to say, Stan Van Gundy had a great line, and I don't remember the exact stats he was using before half or after half or – something but they were like oh of something from three sub 30 shooting from the floor up by five it's like <laughs> right when, right when that happened i kind of felt like okay this is insane that they are playing probably their worst game and everyone says they're gonna have to play their b game and you'll have to play their a your a game yeah and they were still up by five well and and you know to draw a parallel with the game that took place yesterday afternoon in in purdue and uh, uh tennessee i thought it was a bad sign for tennessee that Purdue was tied, and they were one of nine from behind the arc. Yeah, I'm like, you're you're t Dalton Connect was having the game of his life on that stage, right? And Purdue was one of nine from behind the arc, and it's a tie game. Like, sorry, th this game's over um, because Purdue's eventually going to knock down shots. Dalton Connect eventually started missing some shots late, mainly inside the three point line. Yeah, some shots that he typically makes, but again, he was out there almost every second of the game. So it's hard to fault a guy that 40 minutes in, when he's running around trying to get open shots, sprinting up and down the floor, playing defense on offense, he's running back and forth across the court to get open shots. That the last few minutes of the game, he misses a a a, 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 a couple close ones in the lane. Uh, yeah, it, it makes sense. He's the reason they were in that spot. Dude, he got zero help. Zakai Ziegler was horrendous Rough. in this game. Rough. And for some reason, he decided, I'm going to keep jacking up threes. <laughs> you know how you know how Dolan Connect is shooting the ball very well? What if I just shoot threes instead? Yeah, I mean, because there was an open three where Ziegler had the ball and he was one pass away to an open connect. <gasps> and he took the three and bricked it. You know how Ganey uh, is, is, is coming off the bench and hitting a couple threes? <laughs> what if I just shoot those threes yeah. instead? Um, to, to go back to UConn and Illinois for a second, because we'll get to Purdue and, uh, and Tennessee. Um, Brad Underwood had the definition of insanity when he was talking at halftime or uh, uh, in the first half about the strategy that they are using against Klingon, Kling Kong. Here's Brad Underwood um, giving you what the definition of insanity is. We're not backing down. We're going to do what we do. Well, he didn't block a hundred, but he ended up with five blocks and three steals. Like it wasn't, I get the, the game plan of we're attacking, we're attacking, we're attacking. We're not changing what we do because of them. But eventually at some point when your team and you don't have Zach Eady on the floor, when your team is driving to the lane against a 7-2-280, and he is just controlling the paint and blocking shots and grabbing every board, uh, uh, eventually you change the strategy. You, you start to do something else. Because in that 30 to nothing run, I mean, Illinois was just lost offensively. Oh. And that's the thing that makes UConn so great is defense is so good. Now, offensively, they're, they're clearly good. They're top five in both offense and defense in Ken Palm, uh, which is why I think they win the national championship yet yeah. again this year. But defensively, they are just so good and so connected. And the thing that I've noticed about UConn in these tournament runs is that they don't let up. They continue to go for the throat. You know, typical Husky fashion <laughs> to <laughs> go right for the throat. It's what they do. And Dan Hurley has his team, no matter what the time and score or whatever, like they are locked in and focused. And you wonder how they lost three games this year. But again, you're playing 38 games this year. So understandable is how they would have lost a few games along the way. But they are so good and so dominant, and they've turned over the roster a couple of times. Cam Spencer was not on this team last year. Yet yeah. Cam Spencer comes in and looks like he's been playing for UConn for the last four or five years. Um, let's hear from uh, uh, Jay Williams and Seth Greenberg. They both sort of had the same 
um, uh, point about what UConn is and what makes them so difficult to go up against. Let's play uh, clip six. Let's play Jay Williams here on uh, why UConn is as good and dominant as they are. I think there is a relentless pursuit of excellence in everything that this team does. And we live in an age where I have a conversation with a lot of people. People are afraid to coach young people hard, right? All you hear is yeah. NIL. Will somebody offer him a bigger bag or the transfer portal? All these things are true. But this guy has created a culture conducive to coaching young people hard, and they respond. And you saw that in every detail of how they executed last night in whooping Illinois' tail. I compared a little bit to the Chiefs in what the Chiefs are doing. And we talked about this when they signed Hollywood Brown. Or No, we, we talked about this with Drew Tranquil's press conference. That's what it was. Drew Tranquil's press conference when he said he – he, he uh, rediscovered the childlike love of football by playing with the Chiefs and coming into the organization and the building and everything sort of being the uh, singular myopic view about Super Bowl success, championships, doing things the way that they are expected to be done. And, and that's the level you have to play at or we find somebody else. And, and I made the sort of uh, analogy to a degree of, you know, sometimes you can go out and look at a, a puzzle and and one player is like, oh, this person, you know, completes this puzzle puzzle piece. And I think there's an element of the chief saying, no, we can go get this guy and we bring him in. He's actually going to conform to that puzzle piece. Like he will be shaped and molded so that puzzle is is complete because he comes in here and this is how we do things. And he's going to get on board or we find somebody else. He'll figure it out. You can do that when you've got success. All right. If, if you're doing that with the Panthers, it's like, really? Um we, uh, I got to have roommates in, in this uh, training camp at a college dorm in 100 degrees and humidity, and it's the toughest training camp of my life. I'm doing that yeah, to win two games? No. No, you're doing that to win Super Bowls, so this is what it takes. You win Super Bowls. When Jay Williams talks about you know Dan Hurley coaching hard in the NIL era and the transfer portal era, you can be coached hard because you know there's a – there, there's a net that might be hanging around your neck. There, there's a, uh, a a trophy or a plaque <laughs> <laughs> that could be uh, won uh, when you when you win the national championship. Like there's that carrot that's out in front of you. Like yeah, this is what works. And if I go and get you as a transfer, Tristan Newton from East Carolina, Cam Spencer from Rutgers, and this is his you know only year with UConn, uh, Diara from A and M. When I go and get you and you come to UConn, this is the level of expectation that's going to be done. And there's success that shows that the preparation, the work, the practices, the relentless, relentlessness results in them not only winning, but just ripping out the heart of the other team and destroying the will to want to be out there and continue to fight. And you're totally right. When you have the rings and the ability to say, hey, this is what we do and look at the results, it's why you're correct. It worked for Andy Reid. It worked for Bill Belichick. But a lot of the Bill Belichick disciples would mm-hmm. go off. Joe Judge, well, he's not the one yeah. who, who has all those rings. Yes, he does as a coordinator, but it's different. Yeah. Matt he'd Patricia. Go, he would go to the Giants and say, that, well, this is how we're doing it. And they're like, dude, we won three games. Why? <laughs> no, we're not doing this. This is clearly right. not working. And, and you're right. With UConn, they, I, I've just been so impressed, again, with not just the transfers, but the growth of some of the players. Because I remember te- I have a, one of my best friends, he went to UConn, um, and I talked about Kling, and I go, I remember him last year. This dude was bad last year. All of a sudden, look at him this year. I mean, well, the he's ability— a sophomore. I mean, he was just a freshman last year. But, but like, just the ability to, to, right, to, to, to grow these guys, develop these guys— Keep them in the system, and, and you're right. Finding the puzzle piece that works. I wish puzzles were were like that in real life. I'd be a much better better puzzler. <laughs> I'm just gonna take just this one and, and some... rip it and and uh, move it, and boom, now it fits. But <laughs> it's just what they've done, mm-hmm. the balance they have, and not being. And but in, in the past they have been, and they've still won with like Shabazz Napier, Kimba Walker, going back just a little bit yeah. here, um, and then Shabazz Muhammad, all those guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of Shabazzes, like right? Okafor and uh, that that group. You yeah, but know, they've won national titles, you know, with Calhoun and Dan Hurley and Ali. And they've done it all just different ways, though. It, yeah. it is like the Chiefs. They've done it with offense. They've done it with defense. Yeah. They've done it. It's it's just so damn impressive. Well, I mean, we talk about Blue Bloods. Like, UConn's in the group now. I mean, there's, there's, oh, easy. there's, there's no good. I know people have, uh, you know, it's like new money. 
Well, yeah, but UConn's new money doesn't matter. They're 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 there at the party. When was when was the last time Indiana blood. did anything? Yeah, no, I hey, you ain't got to argue with me about that, <laughs> All right? Um, but they're they're absolutely blue blood in what they're doing, and if they win back to back national championships, uh, here's Dan Hurley. This is post game yesterday. So later in the game, he comes out on the court and he starts, you know, pumping up the crowd and screaming with the uh, the UConn fans and everything. The question is included because there was a clip that was played of Dan Hurley saying that his fans are obnoxious as bleep, <laughs> right? Uh, and so people had that clip and were having fun with it. Uh, here's the question and then uh, the answer for uh, Dan Hurley about that sort of interaction with the fans. Late in the second half, like the 3.33 mark or whatever, after that timeout, you walked out to midcourt and were yelling something towards the crowd. Can you take us through that moment and like just how you were feeling there and what you said? Yeah, I mean, I finally felt safe. You know, you see enough games, man, and it's like, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm always concerned that something bad could happen. But, um, you know, it, it, we've defied the odds this year, you know, just with past champions and losing everything that we lost from last year's team and having this giant target that we've carried the entire year, the UConn target plus the defending national champs target. Um, you know, plus we're a program. Our players have a lot of confidence and a lot of swagger, and um, and, and our fan base again is obnoxious as <laughs> on social. So everyone hates us. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was a chance to celebrate with them because uh, you know our fan base and, and this and our and our organization right now. Um, you know, it's it's an us against the, the world of college, of college basketball, and I wanted to celebrate with them a little bit. I do love the uh, you can get an us against the world when it's uh, UConn doing what they're doing and it's from a success standpoint. But I don't know why you had to call out Anthony Sherman like that. <laughs> like, why are you like Sherman? I wonder if if Sherm's offended by that, by uh, Dan Hurley saying that he's obnoxious as bleep. I mean, come on. By the way, it'd be easy to be obnoxious if you're a UConn fan because a couple things. One, you've been as successful as any program in America the last 25 years. Yeah. And yet... Those programs that historically have been successful and not nearly as successful as you have said, no, you don't belong in this group. No, 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 no. You're 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 not a blue blood. We're the blue bloods. You're you're you've got a, a good run going. But no, they've won a national championship with three different coaches in the last twenty five years. Three different coaches. That's not. I mean, that's as blue blood as it gets. Yeah. If you're talking about, well, the program can also create the coach because of the program, right? The program can elevate a good coach to a great coach, a great coach to a Hall of Fame coach. And now they will have, you know, a, two different coaches if, you know, they win, you know, Saturday and Monday, have two different coaches with multiple national championships at that school. They're absolutely blue blood and as dominant as they've been. Yeah, I can understand why you'd be obnoxious. Chiefs fans are obnoxious on Twitter. I was going to say, well, the, the Chiefs parallels right there were just incredible. <laughs> the, the fans on Twitter, which again, yeah. whatever we think, we're obviously here. But you look at the 31 other fan bases in the NFL, they, who will they rank as the most obnoxious right now? It'll be the Chiefs. It's going to be the Chiefs because they, yeah. they continuously win. And, the, you know, we're trying to do something that hasn't really been done. The back-to-back -back championships. What did the Chiefs just do? Back-to-back -back championships. The target on your back. Target on your back for Kansas City. Um, I'm just laughing. I was like, this sounds like the Kansas City Chiefs right yes, now. Absolutely. It does. And uh, there are a lot of, um, whether you know people like it or not, I don't care, a lot of people that are like, oh, the Chiefs are the most sensitive fan base on Twitter. Whatever. I mean, we'll defend our own. Yeah. And it's sensitive if it's like, oh, two years ago, right? Travis Kelsey. Not Nan, one of y'all thought we were going to do this. Oh, whatever. And then you see people that are actually throwing the receipts out there. Oh, you're so sensitive. Like, well, no, you're trying to gaslight yeah. and say that we didn't go through an offseason when they traded Tyreek Hill and Russell Wilson came in the division and uh, Khalil Mack and Devontae Adams and J.C. Jackson and uh, you got these, uh, you know, Deshaun Watson to the Browns and Buffalo Bills get Vaughn <laughs> Miller. Like, oh, the Chiefs are done. They're not even going to make the playoffs. Then they win the Super Bowl. And it's like, well, everybody believed you would do that. No, 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 no. We lived through it. Yeah. We talked about it on a daily basis. All right. You're not going to gaslight us. And, well, you're so sensitive for pointing that out. Okay. That's fine. Then then if you want to go that route, that's that's whatever. The, the Chiefs, you know what? Here's the thing. Successful, be obnoxious. How about this? You think the Chiefs fans are sensitive? Yeah. How about your team win a, a few Super Bowls? Then come talk to us. You know, sure. We'll be sensitive. We'll be obnoxious. Win. It's lonely at the top.
That's right. Heavy, Lonely at the top. Heavy is the head, man. Heavy is the head. Uh, it's different when, like, oh, this these fans are so obnoxious. Yeah, but they're winning. Bills fans, Bengals fans, Chiefs fans are obnoxious. They're winning. <laughs> Super Bowls. It's because who's obnoxious? <laughs> the teams that don't win Super Bowls and act like they do, or the teams that do win Super Bowls and act like they. At least one side can back it up with the team out there on the field. As we're watching the Super Bowl on NFL Network right now, going into <laughs> overtime, they want the ball. They want the ball. I, they wanted the ball. Hey, this is exactly what we wanted, guys. They wanted the ball. Um, we're watching that. It's a, yet another. Victory for the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Yes, there's obnoxiousness. And UConn, be obnoxious. Yes. You, you, winning, you're on your way to winning another national championship. Yeah. People talk smack. And people don't want to let you into their group of blue bloods. <laughs> people talk smack and then get bounced. And like, why are you so... Because you talk smack <laughs> up until you got bounced, and now you're trying to play the victim. It doesn't work like that, guy. Mm-hmm. Oh. Bella, not your, not, your, not your friend, pal. Come on, not Chief. Not your pal, buddy. Not your buddy, friend. 913-912-4810. Uh, let's take a time out. We'll come back. I want to get into um, a little bit of uh, Purdue and Tennessee. And then uh, a little bit of uh, NC State. And then uh, Kim Mulkey ver- uh, v. Kent Babb. Or is it Kent Babb v. Kim Mulkey? Uh, we'll talk about uh, that as we continue rolling more zone next.
All right, we'll continue right here on Sports Radio 810 WHB. Coming up at noon, we'll talk with uh, Josh Kaiser, One Royal Way podcast. Get his thoughts on the uh, one and two Kansas City Royals. They are under 500. It's already started. Uh, we'll do that coming up at uh, noon. But the uh, dominant pitching staff for the Royals and their starting staff has been uh, fun to see so far. And the offense busting out the bats yesterday. So we'll talk with Josh Kaiser coming up at uh, noon about the Royals. Uh, let's play a, a couple of clips here. This one was funny. Uh, NC State, uh, you know, uh, goes to the Final Four. This was from – I just – I saw it on Twitter, so I decided to, to play it. I don't know. It could be it could be used for a learn the funniest or best later on. Who knows? Maybe I should save it for that. I'm not going to. But uh, this is uh, NC State football. Um, this is uh, halftime, and uh, Dave Doran, the NC State football coach, uh, being interviewed um, and and having some choice words for the uh, studio uh, analysts. Uh, tell Steve Smith in the studio this ain't a basketball school. He can kiss my ass. Uh, well, <laughs> I saw that going around Twitter yesterday. I'm like, well, <laughs> Dave Doran, love Dave Doran, local guy. Um, but uh, but thought that was funny. This is not a basketball school. This is a football school. <laughs> We're now in the final four again. Uh, we'll see if the football side makes the uh, college football playoff anytime soon. Uh, but on the other side of the uh, region that NC State will be going up against, it is uh, Purdue that knocked off Tennessee. And the conversation around this uh, 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 Purdue win seemed to be about Zach Eady and whether or not he was getting away with all these fouls or getting away with three seconds in the lane. Here's Rick Barnes after the game was over talking about uh, the difficulty uh, with uh, Zach Eady on the, on the uh, Zach Eady in the game on the other team. I can just tell you he's a, he's a difficult guy to guard against, but he's a difficult guy for referees to officiate to, and I don't care what any of them says. It's, he's a hard guy to do that with because he's a unique guy in terms of how he, how he plays. It has brought about a lot of conversation about Zach Eady and how he's officiated or if he's getting – he's in the lane for like seven, eight seconds. He's in the lane so long. And, dude, I think Rick Barnes is right. I think he's right. I I think it is difficult to officiate Zach Eady. In fact, I think Tennessee fouled him way more than they called. (laughs) I think Tennessee had way more fouls on Zach Eady than were actually called because it's the Shaq treatment. You grab Shaq's arm and he busts right through it and dunks, you don't call a foul. But if Shaq were smaller, not as dominant, not as big, and you grab the arm and then the arm goes down and they can't dunk it, well, that's a foul. Well, yeah, but it was a foul both times. The defender is gaining an advantage by doing something that is outside of the rule book. All right, you cannot do that. You cannot slap down on the dude's arm. And Zach Eady, the way he is officiated, is difficult because he is strong. He is bigger than other guys on the floor. That when he's going up for a layup or whatever, and he might get bodied or hit, and his body doesn't move. It doesn't fall off its path, off its line, as easy as some other players do. And then it's not a foul call. I agree with Rick Barnes. He is difficult to to officiate. Tennessee had way more fouls (laughs) than they called against Zach Eady. And this is somebody who, you know, I wanted Tennessee to win because our player pool, I've got Dalton Connect. And I think the winner of that game, Dalton Connect or Zach Eady, would have been the high score in the tournament. So if Tennessee won, then I would have, uh, assuming that uh, Dalton Connect would have at least one more game of 20, 25 points or whatever, uh, maybe two, that I would, you know, more than likely, a pretty decent chance of me winning the uh, high score in the tournament. So I wanted Tennessee to win, but... I didn't, I didn't watch that game and go, boy, the refs really screwed Tennessee. I watched that game and went, Purdue's the better team. Dalton Connect was awesome, but Purdue's the better team. And credit to Matt Painter, who finally got to a Final Four, and it was cool to see Gene Cady there and Matt Painter. And it's the first time I've ever seen somebody cut down the nets without a ladder. That, uh, <laughs> did you watch Zach Eady reaching up and cutting the net? Not needing a ladder. That was my best, actually. A Son little preview. Sorry, a preview. We'll, we'll get to that in uh, two hours from now. Uh, but, um, yeah, so I've never seen that before. He's difficult to officiate. 
Yeah, but you also foul him a lot more than he gets called, uh, you know, against. I also needed Tennessee to win for my March Madness <laughs> yeah. money bracket. Right. If Tennessee won, I would have won a good chunk of change. Now that they lost, I no longer mm-hmm. am in it because I'm going to get second or third because we all have UConn winning, right? Uh, of course, yeah. Uh, but but when it comes down to it, you, you saw the 25 fouls for Tennessee and only 12 against Purdue. So I think people are going to have that knee jerk reaction, almost like Rick Barnes had. But if you watch the game, you're right. They were fouling Edie almost every single play. It's also because you're putting a six eight dude on him. I, I, I get it. AD was very inefficient. You took him out. You put a Waka in. A Waka six eight, six eight against seven five. Mm-hmm. Of course he's gonna foul. Like he was trying his best. And, and you're seeing it, to your point again. They're putting Tennessee defenders, their arms outstretched when Zach Edie is trying to back them down. That is a foul every single time. As a man who's 5'10 and who would do that himself, (laughs) when I play basketball, I get it. But I also understand that is a foul. Yes, you don't call it every single time, and the refs can't call it every time because the game would be so slow, it would be miserable. But you can't complain about it because you are doing it. Tennessee fouled 25 times at a minimum. I actually thought Tennessee got away with a couple late in the game that actually went their way. Dalton connected a nice step through. He missed that little, you know, eight-footer in the lane. They called a foul. They're about two or three in a row where I'm like, are the refs trying to help get this margin of fouls closer just so it doesn't look as bad? Yeah, I was fine because it got connect free throws. I mean, that's different. <laughs> Those are That's a different call. I don't know why you're bringing that up, Sterling. Uh, but but also, you, you've got to look at the the matchup. Tennessee is ranked 261st in the country in fouls. In fact, defensively, they are a physical team defensively. Zach Eady is the number one player in America in fouls drawn per 40 minutes, which makes sense. He's an incredibly difficult dude to guard down low. And if you're trying to body him and, and muscle up and he turns and then you hit him with the button, that, that's a foul. He's number one in America. So you got the 261st team in America in fouling versus the player who has drawn the most fouls in America per 40 minutes. And you're going to complain that there were too many foul calls on Tennessee. Like, that's just the – that was going to be the matchup. It was going to be how do you survive Zach Eady? And they didn't. If you told me that Dalton Connect scored almost 40, I'm like, all right, Tennessee's going to win. But then if you told me Zach Eady also scored 40, okay, well then Tennessee's going to lose because he's not the only scorer on that team. The issue for Tennessee as well, kind of with your point, Zach Eady has other weapons on Purdue he can go to, dish out to, get open looks. Purdue was not hitting. Quite frankly, they were not yeah. good from the free throw line either. So Purdue, if you're looking at this, I think more times than not, they would have won actually by more points. But but Tennessee, outside of Connect, was just atrocious. We mentioned it earlier, Zakai Ziegler. Uh, one of eight from the three-point line, three of 12 from the field. It just felt like he was jacking shots up. Uh, Sorry, stop it. Just give it to connect. Ganey mm-hmm. felt like he was starting to get something going. Um, didn't get enough shots, in my opinion. I thought they should have tried to run more plays for Ganey in this one. It, it was just, again, Mayshack's not a scorer. James is a fine player. He's not necessarily a scorer, and he had yeah. a, a, a decent game. It's just there's no offense on Tennessee, especially in this one, outside of connect, and it just made it too difficult. Yeah, and, and he also took 31 shots to get to 37. Yeah. So, I mean, he was... Started off hot and really kind of fizzled. Yeah, 14 of 31. But it's understandable because in the second half late in the game, nobody else was scoring. He was the guy that was taking the shots because he was the one that was actually scoring that day. So, you know what? Let's get the ball to Dalton Connect. Let him go and, you know, try to make a bucket, get fouled, knock down a three. I mean, he was dynamite in the game, but it wasn't enough for them to ultimately get past uh, Purdue and make it to the Final Four. And again, I think this is a collision course with Purdue and UConn, which would bring Klingon versus Edie in the national championship game. Here's Zach Edie on um, coming out of high school and being recruited and uh, what teams, you know, were looking at him and, and, and sort of his view and, and what's continued to drive him to be, you know, this uh, national player of the year. There were so many coaches that, that looked over me. Um, like you could name a program, I can name a coach that looked over me. The Tennessee Rick Barnes is a great coach, but he he was in a bunch of our practice, looked over me. Like it's kind of been the story of my life. People have doubted me, people look past me, and can't do that anymore. I just think it's hard to look over him. You know, 
than a ladder or the guy's seven four, three hundred pounds. Like it's difficult. How do you look over him? You and know? He was seven three apparently coming out of high school. So I, <laughs> you're right. I don't, was Sean Bradley the yeah. guy? Was was it Sean Bradley and Yao yeah. Ming? But it's also like understandable if you've got this big stiff. Like well, he's seven three and you know, two hundred and seventy pounds, and is not coordinated. Doesn't move all that well. Kind of want, yeah, okay, cool, he can be in the lane. But Matt Painter brought the guy in, and four years later, he's incredibly dominant, and they're going to the Final Four. Let's take a timeout. We'll come back. I do want to get into the uh, Kent Babb, Kim Mulkey um, back and forth. Not even a back and forth, just Kent Babb's profile and Kim Mulkey's uh, reaction to that. And, of course, right here on Sports Radio 810 WHB tonight, 6 o'clock, in what would have been a fantastic national championship game matchup is a an elite eight game lsu and iowa tonight we're playing that right here on sports radio 810 whb followed by uconn and usc you get angel reese caitlin clark juju and uh and Paige beckers tonight going back and forth it should be an awesome amazing night of college basketball tonight i know i won't be doing anything but just being in front of the tv and those on the main screen Royals on the on the, uh, the 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 side TV, one of the the smaller screens, but the uh, the basketball coming up tonight will be center stage. We'll take a time out, come back more zone next.
I'll be heading to the Final Four coming up on uh, Thursday and Friday. I'll be down in Phoenix with uh, all of the interviews. Coaches, players, personalities, analysts. It'll be there in Phoenix coming up uh, this week, Thursday and Friday. Coming up tonight, I mentioned uh, LSU and Iowa. 6 o'clock right here on Sports Radio 810 WHB. Uh, Kent Babb had the uh, story that came out on Saturday in the uh, Washington Post, the profile on Kim Mulkey. And um, I want to hear a few clips from Kent Babb on this that was on um, uh, ESPN Radio yesterday. But first, uh, let's play clip number 12 here. Um, let's hear Kim Mulkey. And uh, she was asked, uh, <laughs> this is Kim Mulkey weighing in on uh, the, uh, the Kent Babb piece that came out on Saturday. I hadn't read that trash. I'm not going to read it. That's why I hired lawyers. The lawyers will review it, and when this season is over, they'll give me a call and say, this is our next step, reading that stuff. I just love that. I haven't read that trash. (laughs) I mean, it didn't even matter what she said after that. It's just the starting, I haven't read that trash. My lawyers. Play that anytime when it's like, uh, hey, did you check out uh, Jason's blog on Sports Radio 810? that trash come on tell him, damn it i know we were I, I, I oh, trying to give him the, the cue too the, 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 the oh, finger no. point like come on i hadn't read that trash you know sterling wrote something uh on his uh, twitter it was a long tweet on his twitter just about uh, his life and things like that i hadn't read that trash dylan you're supposed to put something good there <laughs> like wow it was beautiful like, well, no it's, it wasn't beautiful at all i hadn't read that trash nor should you nobody needs to read that long tweet um, so she didn't read that. I read it. And what I took from it was, oh, this is a profile on a nationally recognized coach that is at the top of their game and is winning championships. And here's the story of their life presented with the investigative sort of reporting. And you can draw your own conclusions from that. Because even with the allegations of um, the, you know, homophobia for Kim Mulkey with some of the, you know, gay players that she had. Even presenting that, Kent Babb also then presented, here is this former player that said in no way, shape or form is she homophobic. Here is this, you know, uh, uh, gay player that has said she is not homophobic at all. She didn't treat me any differently than anybody else. So here are the allegations, here's a rebuttal, here's this, here's that back and forth. That's not a hit piece at all. That's just, and and here's Kent Babb yesterday, and I thought this was interesting because, you know, he was asked what the motivation, this is clip number uh, 13, what's the motivation for writing this about uh, Kim Mulkey in the uh, Washington Post? I wanted to find out what is the cost of the success that a coach has at this level, like this unrelenting, constant success that has been going on for like 25 years. And I, when I started this, I didn't even know that she had won like four national championships um, as an assistant coach and player combined. And it's just, there, there's always a cost. And I wanted also to ask her, like when I originally pitched her on the story in December 2021, and we had a very nice, 30 minute 45 minute conversation we got along great um it was you know hey i want to see in this nil world where where you can transfer you can come and go how this little five foot four lady from the country can connect with these people who are nothing like her who are way younger and you know it's just a different world and she keeps doing it i love the idea of I wanted to see what the cost of success at that level is. So, you know, I I would love to read about that too. And I think we got a pretty decent idea of what drives Kim Mulkey as to why she is so successful, why she has been as successful as she is, why she may not be liked by a lot of people, and her past with being estranged from her father, being estranged from her sister, having no relationship with people at different points in time at Louisiana Tech and Baylor that she was close with at times, 
because there's an element of either you are fully on board with me or I ain't ever talking to you again, right? But what's the cost of being that particular driven person? It could also be cost of relationships with former players and family members. It was a fascinating read.
Google Fiber award-winning internet without data caps, annual contracts, or hidden fees. Internet proud to be from Kansas City. Now available up to 5 gigs and the 1 gig internet. Same price since 2012. Let me tell you, with the games coming up tonight, I don't know how much severe weather will hit or when it will hit or where it will hit or how bad it will be tonight. But I know this. Previously, when there was a uh, satellite involved with uh, my provider, I'd have to worry about being able to watch the television when there was a cloud within uh, seven miles. And now that I have, uh, you know, cut the cord, I've got a different provider and YouTube TV, but you also have to have that Internet provider that's there. I know tonight, whether it rains, sleets, storms, snows, I don't know, hail, that uh, my TV will be on with the drama and the stage tonight that'll be set for two teams, four teams, excuse me, trying to get to the Final Four and a game that might be, I don't know, the, the, the most watched women's college basketball game in ever, probably, in ever. We'll talk to Josh Kaiser here in a second. Uh, one Royal Way podcast. He will join us and we'll get his thoughts on uh, this uh, Royals team and the one and two start to the season. But some positives to take away. And as people know, especially this early in the season, certainly going to be uh, choosing to um, look at more of the positive part of what we're seeing until proven otherwise. And I know that the Royals have not earned the benefit of the doubt. That is certainly one part of this conversation is benefit of the doubt to this Royals organization if they start the way that they started 0-2. Is there benefit of the doubt for this team to be given um, a grace period to let's see what they're going to be? Josh Kaiser, One Royal Way Podcast, joining us here in the zone. Josh, what's up, man? How are you, sir? Doing swell. Had a great weekend. Got some, uh, got some Easter time with the nice. family and uh, had a great weekend. So how about you guys? Great? Very, very good weekend. Fun weekend. Uh, got a, a little baseball game in on uh, Saturday with my son. Got the Easter time and the uh, uh, Easter egg hunting yesterday while watching an 11 nothing victory by the uh, Royals and watching some college basketball. So, yeah, it was a, it was a good day. Do you participate in the uh, Easter egg hunts or anything, or uh, do you hide the eggs? Like, uh, what's, uh, what's Josh's role on Easter? Boy, we... <laughs> Shout out to my mom, but also my wife, because they just crushed Easter this year. But my role was playing the Easter Bunny in the hiding of the eggs. And uh, usually we have family time. We have like, you know, seven or eight kids and somehow schedules didn't work out. So two or four kids got to hunt 110 Easter eggs. And wow. uh, I got to hide and find 110 <laughs> hiding spots for them. So uh, we, we got real creative. It got we, some of those eggs got mobile and were hiding on <laughs> on people's persons, which, uh, I mean, things things got uh, got a bit, you know, tough. We had to get creative around that house. That is amazing. I, I love that. Uh, 110. Now, are they the uh, the plastic ones, or are you going out and actually hiding some eggs that if you don't find one, you're going to have to uh, search it out and smell it uh, in a, a week or so? They were the plastic ones, but Good. they, Good shout you. out to mom again, they were full of the chocolate and the candy. So had they been ran over by the mower, <laughs> it could have been a bit, a bit of a uh, melted chocolate, chocolate spray that uh, was not wanted. You know, somehow my kids, um, they had two different Easter egg hunts on Sunday, one of them filled with candy. And then apparently they had another one that uh, came to my attention after it was over that uh, there was diff- there was like a money Easter egg hunt. I didn't know that. Mm, mm-hmm. uh, my son let me know that he came away with 12 bucks. He's like, Dad, I've Ooh. made $12. I'm like, what the hell kind of Easter bunny is this? <laughs> I don't remember that. Inflation. Uh, the, it's the Easter bunny yes. inflation. I'm like, wow. Yep. The, I, no, just Typically, here's some jelly beans, right? No, no. You uh-huh. get, uh, here's a dollar. Here's a $5 bill. Here's uh, you know two quarters. This guy ended up with $12. Yeah, I remember growing up, we had a town Easter egg hunt that some of them had, like, silver dollars. Oh, nice. And to an eight-year-old, like, it was the <laughs> exactly. coolest thing. It felt like you had a little piece of piece of pirate treasure that you were gifted. But nowadays, it's like, how, do I spin this? Like, is this – you might as well just wrote me a check. I don't need a <laughs> silver dollar. I can't spend it. 
I, I don't know what to do with it. I can't throw it in a vending machine. It's it's just it's just metal. I don't understand this. Give an eight year old a traveler's check. I mean, what 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 am I supposed yeah. to do with this thing here? Uh, yeah, that's right. full of IOUs. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, well, that's my son's piggy bank. Oh, we'll get to him, son. You know, we just yep. we didn't have cash, and uh, well, the babysitter. You know, we've I've got to run by the ATM. I'll get you back. <laughs> don't worry. Yep. No here's, a, here's an IOU to the uh, piggy bank. I'm good for it, man. I promise. Good for it. You know, look at my credit. Yep. Don't look at the credit, but just know that I'm good for it, man. Can I get a uh, Can I get a marker? Can I get one more marker, son? <laughs> you know, just to pay yep. for whatever's coming up here. My son almost learned a valuable lesson in uh, in in betting. Over the weekend, um, we were watching, uh, gosh, what game was uh, Saturday night? Uh, don't think that was the, uh, was that Alabama Clemson or it was uh, UConn? That sounds right. UConn, Illinois, whichever one it was. Uh, but we were watching the game and he was like, oh, that team's not going to score again. And there was like 45 seconds left. I'm like, they'll score like a, a buck at one point. He's like, no, they won't. Want to bet? I'm like, yeah, let's bet 50 bucks, dude. He's, and he starts Ooh. smiling. He's like, uh, I don't know. I'm like, you got all those Target cards, right? You got the, your birthday Target cards you haven't spent? Let me go grab $50 out of that one, you know? Or, you know, you just simply say, you know, we're, we'll watch the game. He's like, I don't know. Uh, I was like, you know, what do you want to do? He's like, no, I don't want to bet. And then five seconds later, the other team scored. <laughs> Laid it up. It was good. And I was like, see, son, aren't you glad you didn't do that? Now you're eight years old. You don't need to be betting anybody, okay? You would have lost 50 bucks. It's a li- nice little yep. message, you know, um, nice little uh, learning experience for you, okay? Now, That's by you even thinking about it, I'm still going to take I'm still gonna take 20 bucks from you just for, you know, the <laughs> lesson to be learned, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and you also, you're welcome. Yeah, now you know moving forward. Um, uh, plus, I'm going to take that 20 bucks and put it in your piggy bank. Now I'm uh, uh-huh. <laughs> closer to my goal yep. of uh, we're only $1,100 in bet now. We're going to rip up a few of those IOUs. <laughs> yep. right. Here's a $5 one. Here's a, oh, the ice cream man's coming by. <laughs> Here's a, yep. a $10 IOU. I got you, bud. Um, Josh Kaiser, One Royal Way podcast. Okay, so it ended on a high note, thankfully. Uh, what do you make of uh, what you've seen so far, just in general, these three games, three games in, uh, but uh, this team is one and two. They are plus four in run differential. Uh, what do you make of uh, the Royals' uh, start to the season? Um, well, it feels like we're inconsistent again, and I think that's uh, that's kind of what bit them in the butt last year, but I do think it looks better than it did last year. Last year's start also against the Twins, so it's kind of fun to kind of lob those two series up side by side, but both series had some really good starting pitching on both sides. One of the games had quite a bit of runs scored by both offenses, and uh, luckily the Royals were the ones to pull out the the big bats yesterday and decided to hit all the home runs and make up for all the runs they didn't score the first two games. <laughs> so it, it has been encouraging. There's been some definitely some bright spots, and there's some other things that you know we need to get cleaned up and get started. I think. You know, Vinny and Hunter Renfro in particular need to get uh, get rolling, but I have faith that the, both of them will figure that out. But, um, I mean, MJ is hitting the ball, scorching hot. Like you mentioned earlier, Bobby Wood Jr. is leading the MLB in average. So, hey, Cole Reagan's had a great start, and he was like the worst one of the three. <laughs> so Amazing. That's, that's always fun to see. Brady Singer yeah. throwing four seamers. Lugo's working out and pitching, pitching efficiently. You know, the bullpen has, you know, had mixed results, but that is a major league bullpen. That's how it goes. So, I don't know. It's it's three games, sample size. There are good things, and then you can pull pull things from, you know, whether you're a believer of this team or whether you're a non-believer of this team. I think you can pull things out of that first three series or the first three games either way. So, that just is what it is. My uh, my main takeaway, and, and we'll see about the offense and, and if this is some sort of a, a breaking out the bats and, and they'll find some consistency offensively, whether it was just two good pit, uh, pitchers they went up against on Thursday and Saturday, and certainly yeah. they're good pitchers. Um, and, and we'll see what the bullpen looks like when – it might be, you know, other high leverage situations, and hopefully they look like a professional bullpen. Um, but one of the reasons I had more hope and promise for this year and this Royals team was the fact that I felt like, and you and I have talked about this, that at least four nights, you know, out of five, you feel like they got a chance to win. Uh, I don't know what Alec Marsh is going to look like or what that fifth starter spot's going to look like, but one through four. And hopefully Singer, you know, will uh, be a lot better without the World Baseball Classic and him, you know, riding pine for nine instead of actually going out there and getting some innings in and getting ready for, you know, the regular season. It was those four guys, Josh, that you felt like give you a chance to win. And, you know, 
a couple of weeks ago, if I'm sitting here on a Monday and I'm like, well, the, the Royals are one and two, but the starters have gone 19 innings. They've given up only 15 total base runners. They've struck out 23. They've only given up two earned runs, and both of those runs came on uh, two strike counts with Cole Reagans. Um, they've got a sub-1 ERA and a sub-8, uh, sub-0.8 uh, whip. Um, you know, it, it feel pretty good. And then you say, well, Michael Walker hasn't pitched yet. Because <laughs> my response would be yep. through three games, okay, let's see what Brady Singer looks like, if he can be pretty good. No, Michael Walker has not gone out there and, uh, and thrown an inning yet. That's where my optimism comes in from this first week into baseball, Josh, of, you know, you hear people go, well, it's same old Royals, can't score, and, you know, they're going to lose these games. The bullpen doesn't look any good. Yeah, but those same old Royals didn't have guys that looked like this through three games, and maybe their second best pitcher hasn't gone out and pitched. That's how you avoid a seven game losing streak that the Royals had in April. That's how you avoid a seven and 22 start is by having guys go out there and, and keep you in a game for six, seven innings. 100%. I mean, that's nail on the head. I, it's, it's not the same old Royals because of that pitching rotation. And I think the thing that I love about that rotation the most outside of, you know, the veteran status, the guys with experience, there's, you know, way more in there than there has been in the past. But they're all four are all different looks. Like, Reagan's going to give you cheddar from the left side. Then you can bring in Lugo, who's got a hammer of a curveball. And then great stuff. And then you got Singer who lives off the sinker and the slider that, you know, gets supplemented by a couple of them. And then Michael Waka has a primary change. So have fun with that on all your ground balls as well. So I just love the fact that they're getting the pr- production, you know, we're, I guess we're assuming production off of what, we're, what we've seen so far. But they're getting that from four different looks. It's not just the same guy. You know, if this guy's throwing 93, the next guy's also going to be throwing 93. And it's, it is what mm, it is. Yeah. But. I just love the the different looks that the the starters are giving them, you know, four four out of five days of the week. So we'll see what we got with Alec Marsh. He is kind of an un, unknown at this point, but very promising. Got the stuff. Um, Let's we'll see what he can do with it. But yeah, that rotation is going to be the difference. We've been talking about it for the last few weeks. It, it always is going to be the difference, and it's a uh, very <laughs> very strong catalyst of what this team could be. What do you? Uh, what did you see from Brady Singer then yesterday? Um, you know, I, I mentioned the slow start last year and really the struggles throughout the year at certain times for uh, for Brady Singer, and he took that Singer step two years ago and then you know came back to earth a little bit. Uh, is is there a you know uh, getting excited? Are you tempering enthusiasm for Brady Singer? What he showed yesterday against the Twins? Uh, how do you uh, how do you come away from that start with Brady Singer, the best start of the three, and having the ten Ks and not you know putting men on base and getting quick outs early in the game, a six pitch first inning? Uh, what do you make of uh, Brady Singer? And is this something that uh, is a um, a prequel to maybe what we'll see this year? As a staunch arguer of he needs more than two pitches <laughs> that I've been the last couple of years, yeah. I'm going to use this as some kind of validation that I know what I'm talking about when I really don't. Um, but it was very impressive. He still you know, was still 80% slider sinker, which is fine as long as you've got the stuff and that you have a third or fourth offering that you can show guys that can get, get outs in other ways that you haven't been able to, especially with a team that has experience with you in the Minnesota Twins. They've seen you plenty. They know what they can sit on. So if you're able to show them something that they haven't seen before, that can go a long way. And sometimes that can look like yesterday's six innings or seven innings of two 10Ks or whatever it was. So I hope it is very encouraging. You definitely want to see that coming from a guy that, you know, has had ups and downs and, is just seemingly, you know, a third or fourth pitch away from unlocking something new. We know that the sinker is good. We know that the slider is good. We know that he can throw strikes. We want to be able to see that on a consistent basis. And being able to mix his pitch up, his repertoire up a little bit more, is only going to help him take that step forward. So what I've seen from sitting here, he, he threw 14 four-seam fastballs, and it was against guys that, hit fastballs really well last year. It was a very, very good fastball hitting, and they were all on the left side. So they have a, you know, they have a plan of attack against lefties that he may have struggled with in the past. So I think that is very encouraging as well. So that, that was fun to see as too. Yeah, that's interesting. He went from, you know, you need to develop a changeup against the lefties, and it's a changeup and go down to the minor leagues and maybe work on this changeup against lefties to now 
you mentioned that, and that's an interesting uh, thing to point out that those four seamers uh, came against the uh, the lefties. So maybe that's where you know he's um, he's adding another pitch to the arsenal to get out the left-handed batters with those uh, those four seams. So uh, he ends up throwing fourteen. Although uh, yesterday the the stat cast um, was uh, confused at certain times uh-huh. about uh, which pitch he was throwing, but I'm glad there's an update now of the uh, fourteen four seam fastballs that were there and it's a really good point about those being against left-handed hitters because I hadn't I hadn't seen that or noticed that that uh, most of those pitches came against guys batting from the left side yeah shout out to Royals Weekly those guys do a great Royals podcast as well if you haven't seen that but they were the ones kind of bringing it up to my to my point about who you're throwing it to and how good they are against uh, fastballs in the past so uh, shout out to them they deserve the credit for that but it is a uh, it is also interesting that StatCast didn't pick up any sweepers um, which was interesting. That was another offering that he was trying to, you know, trying to work on. And from what I can t- tell, he didn't throw any either. I think that was pretty accurate. He was kind of still living off of that, uh, off that traditional slider, but maybe a little bit tweaked version of that as well. So, mm-hmm. I think there's still potentially another level that that if that sweeper becomes a usable pitch, that that changeup is used a little bit more, then there could be even more uh, promising results in the future for Brady Singer. So I'm pumped to see what he's got in his next start and uh, to see how his career takes off from here. Visiting with Josh Kaiser, One Royal Way podcast, joining us here in the zone, talking some uh, Royals baseball. Uh, all right, let's talk about uh, Bobby Witt. Let's talk about the kid uh, and and how Who? good. <laughs> he is unbelievable, man. Uh, he doubled away from the cycle yesterday in two different at-bats, and clearly it was on his mind uh, being up there at the plate and wanted to get it done. Obviously, a lot of people wanted to see him get that done and uh, hit for the cycle, but he is uh, leading – uh, the majors in batting average right now, thanks to Mookie Betts struggling last night. Thank you, Mookie. So we can have the conversation mm-hmm. about Bobby Witt leading Major League Baseball in batting average. And he is crushing some pitches and barreling them up and hits a home run to dead center that was uh, low and inside and hit it 110 off the bat. <laughs> Exit velocity 110 yep. to center field on a low and inside pitch. Should not really be possible, to be uh, quite nope. honest with you. Uh, and instead, he does that. Um, is that it's it's pretty obvious, Josh, that uh, Bobby Witt is not putting extra pressure on himself to uh, validate and live up to the contract because seeing that, I mean, you're locked in. You, you are absolutely locked in if you yep. go down and get that pitch and hit it 110 to center. I mean, there were two. His first two hits, the single was scorched off the bat, mm-hmm. and then the triple and the home run were both pitches that should not be possible where they landed. He is so damn strong it is ridiculous that he is able to run as fast as he can this is truly like we talk about in baseball five tool athletes five tool players we just can't wait to to don a player that has five tools bobby witt jr is the truest of true when it comes to five tool athletes it is crazy i'm not going to call him patrick mahomes it's going to be an easy lazy cop but boy he is incredibly exciting I'm with you that he, it's only a matter of time before he hits that cycle. He's had a few opportunities already. Yesterday seemed like it was destined to be the case. It was a breakout, and here come the Royals. They're going to play postseason contention. But it is just insane how good Bobby Wood Jr. is. And the fact that he signed that contract with the Kansas City Royals, he's here for at least you know six, seven years. We'll talk about it down the road, but mm-hmm. you don't have to worry about that. The pressure's off there. He's the face of this franchise. He's the future of this franchise. And it's great to see that it is working out for all parties. It's just an awesome, awesome time to be a Royals fan. Yeah, um, I just it's unbelievable that you know he signed the deal and uh, thankfully he did um, and uh, took care of business. <laughs> How big do you think from just a uh, an overall sort of feeling of confidence uh, was yesterday's game? It's you know Thursday was one game and they lost. Saturday was just one yeah. game and they lost. But if we're having a conversation today about them getting swept by the Twins, and I, I have a feeling it would be, well, let's keep it in perspective. The Twins are good. They're picked to win the division. Now they got the Baltimore Orioles, so it can be a tough start to the season. Um, how much do you think that meant to maybe just perception around this team? I don't know how much in the uh, clubhouse or the ball club itself uh, it meant, but just to see a, a pitcher go out there, be dominant, and to see the offense put some things together and be a few feet away from having back-to-back-to-back home runs in the game. I mean, I think I would almost guarantee you that that whole clubhouse feels like they left the two games on the table. Both of those games were letdowns late in the game that they were both, I mean, they were tied on the one on Saturday going into the ninth. 
uh, Thursday they were definitely in the game. I think it was 2-1 until the 8th or ninth. So it just seemed, I mean, it, 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 they left it on the table. I guarantee you that's going through their minds, and I think the offense especially is wearing, that, uh, wearing those losses on themselves. So it was good to see them respond to that. Those games can really tend to take wind out of your sails early off in the year, and you can, you know, if you don't have any way to stop the bleeding, like the rotation potentially can for the Royals this year, then it's just going to keep snowballing, getting worse and worse and worse, and you're in like a quicksand effect. So uh, shout out Keanu Reeves replacements for that reference. I love that. Um, but I do think that it will go a long ways for this team's confidence. They know that they can do it. They show that they can do it, and they did it. So it's, I think it will boost that confidence quite a bit. It's, it potentially, I mean, again, we need to asterisk this with three-game sample size. But they did play two great pitchers there the first two games, and it is what it is. But um, it is very exciting that they rattled off, you know, four or five home runs in a game is always fun. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the, this uh, these next few days are going to look like for the Royals oh. taking on the, uh, the Orioles. Um, I, 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 I tell you what it might look like, rainy. Uh, is probably what yep. it's going to look like over these three games. I, man, I, I, I'm I'm excited and pumped for Wednesday's matchup with um, Corbin Burns and Cole Reagans. Uh, I just don't think it's going to happen. Uh, I mean, there's uh, yeah. uh, rain all day in Baltimore on Wednesday, uh, and that being in an afternoon game. And uh, so the Royals got Michael Waka going to the mound tonight, and then Alec Marsh going to the mound uh, tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, what do you think of um, uh, of this matchup with the Orioles, and and you know, uh, is it is it another view of can you go in there and just even get one against the Orioles, or you know, build off what they just did against the uh, Twins? Like, how do you how do you view and preview uh, sort of an expectation for what the Royals and one of the best teams and talented teams in, in baseball over these next right now scheduled three games? Yeah, I, I think it's a great measuring stick series. Um, you're not sending in, – in this scenario, Cole Reagans, we're assuming it gets rained out. you got your four and five starters. So it's, it's probably not the top versus the top as far as the pitching goes. But the bats should be there, and it's a good measuring stick for what you have at the bottom of your rotation compared to an uh, AL East winning team and what a rotation on there looks like. So yeah. it, I think it's a great measuring stick of what Baltimore is. I think they play something like nine games against Baltimore in the first 30, something crazy like that. But this is just the first round of a, of a nice little fight that we got on the first you know month, month and a half of the season. It's a great measuring stick to see where the Royals are compared to where they want to be. And if it's something that they could really like use to move forward to take themselves seriously when it's time to, when we get to the trade deadline, if we're like on the bubble or you know wondering like where we are, what do we need to add, where do we need to add it, this is the kind of series yeah. you can go back and point to, being like, what would that series have looked like if we had X, Y, and Z? Yeah. How would that have failed? Because that's what we got to really answer this question before we take the next step in both contention of this year, but even then moving forward. And after this, um, you know, this this Baltimore series, you know, the schedule lightens up a little bit and and they've got the White Sox for four. And I know that they just got swept by the Tigers and the Tigers are three and oh, the Tigers also won three one run games against the White Sox. And, uh, you know, we'll see what the Royals can do for four against the White Sox. Houston just got swept by the Yankees. So they're defeated they haven't won a game either and uh, again I think they're talented so it's not like uh, you know the the Astros coming to town or some you know Astros of you know 2013 or, or anything like that but um, then you've got the Mets that are sort of in a rebuild and then you've got three more with the White Sox like after these three slash what probably is two games against the uh, the Orioles the schedule lightens up and they got an opportunity to uh, to make some hay as much as we talked about how tough the beginning of the season's going to be because you've got Twins and Orioles and Astros and Orioles again and Blue Jays and then Tigers is, you know, a team that's uh, supposed to surprise some people. You know, they've got an opportunity here uh, as a measuring stick. You talked about that. That's a really good way of describing what the next uh, few days could be against the Orioles. And then let's see what it happens against whether peers or teams that are supposed to be worse than them. And they haven't faced off uh, very often, Josh, over the last few years against a team that's like, well, this team is worse than the Royals. This is actually an opportunity for you to get healthy as opposed to the other team looking at that series and saying they have an opportunity to get healthy against the Royals. I remember a time last year where they had strong, I think it was the Astros series that they took, either took two or three or three or four from them 
kind of got the momentum rolling. The season wasn't completely dead yet, but you're like, okay, maybe they can rattle off and you know give us some little encouragement here. They're going into like Detroit, and then they go to Chicago, and then they go to Oakland, and then they just go. It's like a two, two and eight, ten game series between those three series. You're just like, man. This is this is how it's going to be, I guess. We can just go ahead and kill this season, put the bullet in, and be done with it. So, I, I don't want to go to Baltimore, win two or three or three or four, and then then turn into a three and seven series against the next, you know, in theory and on paper, worst team. So yeah. that's what I'm afraid of. I, I don't want to use the Baltimore as a stick as a measuring stick for how good they can be, and then they go and play these quote unquote worst teams and then just completely lose everything. So it, it's a tricky thing about baseball to be able to put too much weight and too much money into one series, but it is kind of fun, you know, to think about it in that way too. I've just been hurt by it so so, so damn much. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do too, too much either. Uh, last one for you. If you're guessing right now, uh, having only seen three games, uh, yesterday, uh, an aberration, sort of a blip on the radar of the offense coming together and getting all the home runs, or it um, relaxes them. They can take a deep breath and uh, go out and, um, and and score some runs and put some things together um, and, and uh, look like a, a, you know, a professional offense over the next few days before they return home against the White Sox. I'm taking plenty of from it. I, the offense shows that they could do it. It is a one-game sample size off of like two or three or four different pitchers. But they did play. I mean, Joe Ryan has the Royals numbers. Pablo Lopez is a Cy Young candidate. Mm-hmm. Those guys are legitimately good. Bailey Ober is an okay pitcher. He's not good against the Royals for whatever reason. He does keep it in the strike zone. The Royals are very aggressive, so maybe that has something to do with it. But it, it, it shows that the offense can score runs. The pressure is now off of them that, you know, they got three really good starting pitching performances of the first three games, which seem legit. There's reason to think that that could be sustained. And as long as everybody stays healthy, bats are awake, we could see some success down the road. So I was encouraged by it, but I'm not getting too crazy with the uh, postseason predictions, but uh, cautiously (laughs) optimistic once again. We'll see what ends up happening. Josh Kaiser, One Royal Way podcast. Josh, as always, appreciate the time, sir. And uh, we will talk uh, talk next week, bud. Thanks, boys. I'll talk to you later. Absolutely. There's Josh Kaiser, One Royal Way podcast. Great stuff from him. As the Royals sit one and two, they get ready for the Orioles. They got a game coming up tonight, tomorrow night, and then a game that is scheduled right now for Wednesday that I just don't think is going to happen, which sucks because that would have been Cole Reagans versus Corbin Burns. But it's also a positive if it doesn't happen because then the Royals don't face Corbin Burns. <laughs> I mean, if it's, I'm okay with Wednesday's game getting canceled. You know, you avoid one of the best pitchers in all of baseball. And then you get ready for the White Sox with your best pitcher on the mound to start a four-game set against a team that you are better than and you should win the series. And these are the, the those are the games where you go out and say, are you going to be serious this year about being a team that can compete? And if that's the case, it can't be a repeat of 2023 when it was like, well, the Royals are struggling. Don't worry. Here come the A's. Now they can get some wins. And then they lost the series to the A's. And at that point, it was like, all right, well, they're done. (laughs) What's the point? I mean, they just lost the series to the A's. This is when they were supposed to, you know, win a couple, three games. And then they went one and two against the the Athletics. I mean, uh, they don't even want to be in that city, let alone try to win games. White Sox coming to town starting on Thursday. So if Wednesday's game gets canceled, then I don't think there's a, you know, I, I won't be shedding any tears. It's a cool baseball matchup, Corbin Burns and Cole Reagans. But avoiding that guy, perfectly fine if you don't have to face him uh, this season. We'll take a timeout released uh, this week. We'll take a timeout, come back, continue rolling, and uh, we'll talk a uh, little more baseball. We'll talk some college basketball as well. Um, an update, um, uh, not much for Rasheed Rice, but sort of restate what's going on with that. Mick Schaefer will join us in the 1 o'clock hour. KSHB 41 Sports Director. More zone right after this.
All right, we'll continue right here on Sports Radio 810 WHB. We'll hang out with Mick Schaefer coming up at uh, 1 o'clock. KSHB 41 Sports Director presented by Empower Payments. We'll talk with him, get some learned funniest best, eliminate some teams in the bracket of sound as we are now down to four teams remaining. UConn taking on Alabama, and then we've got NC State and Purdue coming up on Saturday. I'll be there at the Final Four in Phoenix on uh, Thursday and Friday, giving you all the uh, sight sounds, the interviews with uh, coaches and players and personalities and uh, personalities and analysts there at the uh, Final Four that comes up on Thursday and Friday, 913-912-4810. Uh, we were talking and joking with uh, Danny Hurley earlier, saying that his uh, fan base is obnoxious as bleep. And I said, boy, that's a no reason to take a shot at Anthony Sherman like that. You know, UConn fans. And the text says, uh, it's uh, easy to be a bleep talker when you're built like Anthony Sherman. <laughs> that's true. I don't know that. <laughs> I'm just joking. I don't know that Anthony Sherman is a, is a bleep talker. They're just, <laughs> just joking that I don't find Anthony Sherman to be obnoxious, you know, especially if I see him in person and he's around me and built like that. No, I don't know what you're talking about, Danny. Uh, but no, uh, we talked about UConn fans and whether they're obnoxious or not, they've certainly earned it, especially when they get told that you can't be at the blue blood table and they're like, cool, we'll just, you know, kick down the door and, you know, throw everybody off this table and, and we'll be the only ones there because whatever your definition is, uh, they would meet that criteria unless your definition is you must be awesome in the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s. And if you're not amazing then, then you can't be a blue blood. Okay, so what's the time frame? 25 years? Is it 40 years? Because at the beginning of 2000, if you'd have said, well, this team has been amazing since 1975. Okay, well, that's 25 years. And what if they've done nothing since then? Where UConn has won national championships many since 2000. All right, we're talking about, you know, essentially 25 years. Yeah, they would belong in that conversation. Um, 913-912-4810 text says, uh, so happy for almost Mizzou coach Matt Painter. Mm. And the text says, me sends message to Jason. Jason plays the, I didn't read that trash <laughs> clip from Kim Mulkey. Uh, no, I did. I hadn't read that trash. No, I did. I, uh, I read it, and, and you're right. Uh, almost uh, 913-912-4810 uh, text uh, says and this is where we get into some Royals conversation says uh, let's just remember while it's uh, nice Bobby Witt's a, uh, while it will be nice if Bobby Witt's a superstar we've several other tremendous players around him the Angels at one point had Mike Trout and Shohei Otani on their team and couldn't sniff the playoffs I mean that seems to be the one that people point at and say look look how good this team is and didn't make the playoffs the Padres last year were stacked with talent and somehow didn't make the playoffs. I don't know if the Royals are going to make the playoffs this year or next year or the year after that. Not sure. But I can tell you this. You're a hell of a lot closer to making the playoffs with Bobby Witt on your team than not. If the Royals didn't have Bobby Witt and they had just random shortstop, this Royals team would have, you know, no chance of making the postseason or really being competitive or, or sniffing you know, competing in the American League and, uh, 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 you know, uh, trying to win a division. But throwing a what certainly is a legitimate superstar, finishing seventh in voting in the MVP last year, and right now coming out of the gates with a guy who's perennially a slow starter and is swinging the bat like this. Yeah, you, you got a superstar there, and you are – much more likely. It's better to have that guy than not have that guy, obviously. Um, we know that. Goes without saying. Tex says, uh-oh, vintage Brady Singer. So he's going to suck the next three outings? Great. <laughs> I hope not. Here's Brady Singer uh, yesterday on the um, clip number two here. The offensive run support and his performance overall in his first start of the 2024 campaign. Yeah, I mean, offense was incredible, you know, today. That obviously, 10 runs makes it, you know, a little bit easier to be in the zone and trust yourself. So, no, they obviously helped me out a lot. And that was a heck of a, heck of a first one there for us. What did you think of just the lineup overall, getting out to a really quick start like that? 
Yeah, no, they put together some really, really good at-bats, and, you know, Salvi coming in there with the homer sets a tone. I mean, this offense is really, really good, really incredible, so that just shows what we can do. How important was it for you to get off to a great start this season with three hit performance? Yeah, no, that was that was definitely helpful. You know, I'm happy with happy with that right there, and, you know, I think just the staying in the zone is something I'm going to try to, you know, be more of is, you know, compete with these guys and trust my stuff. Even with the offense stacking on as many runs as they did, mm-hmm. for you to – continue to you know, stay locked in, go out there and throw up zeros, what, what does that mean? Yeah, that's something, you know, I've learned, you know, over my career is, you know, not not slow down, you know, not not take off intensity, even though you get a 10-run lead. So, you know, that was something that I told myself early in the game, when we, you know, when we got all those runs. So, you know, I was happy with that. How much did it mean to you to follow Cole and Seth and Tina? They were a strong start as well. Yeah, no, that was, that was awesome, you know, to watch Cole go out there and do his thing. And, you know, Seth, you know, with his sliders and you know, he's throwing a sinker and a forcing too, you know, and helped me out with a really good game plan um, for these guys as well. So, no, that was, that was really fun to watch those guys compete. Does it feed off onto you when you see those two sides? Yeah, I don't want to be the, the guy that sucks there. <laughs> no, they set the tone on those first two games. They did incredible, and, you know, I, I definitely wanted to go out there and, you know, compete with those guys and, um, you know, put three consecutive good starts together, and, you know, I'm going to watch Walker tomorrow as well. You know, it's how success can uh, build off itself is I don't want to be the one that sucks. You see Cole Reagans go out there, Seth Lugo go out there and do what uh, they did, and Brady Singer goes out there and puts the performance up that he did with three hits and ten strikeouts and, Right now, the starting staff for the Royals, 19 innings, .94 ERA, .789 whip, 15 total base runners, and 23 strikeouts in 19 innings for the starting staff. Uh, Pretty good so far. And then you got Michael Waka going tonight. Uh, 913-912-4810 text says, the Angels and Padres don't play in the American League Central. That's true. That is absolutely true. Um, no doubt. Tech says, uh, Isbell is a home run hitter. Six in his last 11 games. I didn't realize that. Hey, great. I mean, if he can do that at the bottom of the line, I don't think he's going to have six every 11 games. That would be um, a career high for him. <laughs> but, uh, you know. It's a good point on the Padres and uh, Angels, too. The two probably hardest divisions in baseball as well, as far as, you know, competing for even a playoff wild card spot. With the Astros and, um, you know, the Astros. <laughs> <laughs> Rangers. Of, and, yeah, there you go. Yeah, Rangers, I mean, uh, Mariners, all those teams. Yeah, dude, uh, I mean, it's, Drew a blank there. But, they've, yeah. no, they, they've got stud teams out there, and, you know, they've, they've had to deal with those. And they made the playoffs with Mike Trout once. They just didn't win a game because of, you know, your Kansas City Royals yep. in 2014, damn it. Uh, but, yes, with Otani. Ten years ago. Yeah, they also spent a lot of money on Anthony Rendon that didn't want to play baseball anymore. You know, they got paid. He got the bag. And. Let me see how long I can just get through these seasons making a lot of money and doing something that I don't love to do, but there's way too much money involved. And a lot of people have done that, where uh, I'm making a lot of money, I don't love what I'm doing, but I'm going to keep doing it because the money is too good. Difference is, like, you know, I'm hoping you would probably still show up to work. <laughs> you know, you would probably fight through some things because, you know, you probably appreciate the money. Uh, 913-912-4810 is the uh, text line to be a part of the show. We'll take a timeout. We'll come back, wrap up this hour. Mick Schaefer will join us in the 1 o'clock hour. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, Kent Babb, Kim Mulkey, the uh, piece in the Washington Post that to me was just simply a profile on a really successful college basketball coach in Kim Mulkey, the good, the bad, the in-between that Kent Babb presented in a really well-written story and profile of a superstar head coach in college basketball. We'll take a timeout, come back, continue rolling more zone next.
913-912-4810. We'll talk with Mick Schaefer coming up in the uh, 1 o'clock hour. KSHB 41 Sports Director. Tech says uh, UConn cannot be a blue blood. They've only existed for 25 years. You can call them whatever you want, but they will never be a blue blood. Well, I mean, what's the time frame then? So if you if UConn wins, you know, three more championships over the next 10 years and has eight national championships, which would be the second most all time behind uh, UCLA and tied with Kentucky, assuming John Calipari doesn't win one in that time, decent assumption. Or UCLA wins one in that time, uh, decent assumption. They couldn't be a blue blood then either. Because of what took place in 1960, I mean, UCLA's got 11. Ten of those were in 11 years, an 11-year span. They won 10 of those. They've won one since 1975. They've won one in the last 50 years. One championship in 50 years. And that was 30 years ago when they won that championship. And it's only because Jason Sutherland overplayed one. I'm just joking. Sutherland was fine. It's because Buck Grimm didn't jump. And Jason Sutherland overplayed Tyus Edney going to his left. Keep him going left. That's why they have that. I mean, I use a blue blood because of back in the day, right? I mean, they've got one championship since the uh, tournament expanded. They've got five total national championships. McCracken and Bob Knight, they've got two coaches that have won a national title there. UConn already has three different coaches that has won a national title. They've already got five championships, same as IU won in their history. And they're two games away from having six national titles, more than IU, the same as North Carolina. North Carolina's got six. They've got four since the expansion. And they also have three different coaches that have won the national title there with uh, McGuire, Dean Smith, and Roy. At least they've got four since the tournament expanded in 85. This would be six for UConn. Like, I don't know. Uh, people can have their opinions. It's fine if you say they can never be that because traditionally they weren't with these teams that were really good when the tournament had 10 teams in it. That's fine. I would love for my team to be told they'll never be a blue blood while winning five national titles in 25 years. Six. National titles in what could be 25 years. Three different coaches that win one. Multiple coaches that win multiple national titles. I mean, UConn is a well, premier program. But when we talk about premier programs in college basketball, we typically just simply call them Blue Bloods. Yep. They're a premier program. Well, they're a Blue Blood. That sounds like a Kansas fan that's... Because <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm a Kansas fan and I Did will... Did you text that, Dylan? Yeah, it was me. I'll acknowledge them as a yeah. blue blood. I think so because around 2000 was when they started becoming good. It's 25 years. Yeah. I mean, Indiana. Yeah. Indiana's got, you know, a national championship in 1987. It's the last time they won one. 87. It's almost 40 years ago. Last time they won a national championship. But if you say blue bloods, people will. Well, you got North Carolina. You got Duke. Duke is Duke. You got Kansas, Indiana. Really? Why can't we have this like at a table? You know, one in, one out? Get Indiana the hell out of there. What have they done recently? Bob Knight ain't there anymore.
delivery and better value. Go to guaranteedfoods.com. All right, hanging out here on this Monday edition, rainy, overcast Monday edition of the show. Hanging out with Mick Schaefer, presented by, brought to you by Empower Payments. Promising your business savings or they give you $5,000 cash. Visit EmpowerPayments.com today to learn more about that. We always get to learn more about Mick Schaefer when he hangs out with us. Typically, I shouldn't say always, but uh, typically we learn a little bit more each and every time we We hang out with Mick. We do. Uh, What's up, brother? Uh, Nothing much. We're talking a little old school hoops here. Uh, The McDonald's All-American Games are tomorrow from Houston. KC ties. We don't have any players in it, boys or girls side. But Ann Fritz. Ed Fritz's wife, she's the head coach of Blue Valley North. She is the head coach of the West Side for the girls' team. That's awesome. And they're having like a media day right now, and so that's really cool. And you get to pick your own bench, so she's taking one of her assistants, oh, cool. uh, Mike Hilbert, who I believe was at least have a North yes. for a long time, the boys' coach there, Mike right? Mike Hilbert? Yes. He's going to be on the that's bench. That's awesome. He's helping her out now at Blue Valley North. And then Mark Spigarelli, who's coached basketball, girls' basketball forever in town. Pembroke Kelly's now at uh, Blue Springs. He's on the bench as well, so... Kind of a cool Casey tie. I loved Coach Hilbert. That's awesome, man. He always wore the uh, sweater vest, yeah. right? Yeah. It's cool. Uh, very, very cool, man. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. I uh, I have no idea who's in the McDonald's All-America game this year. No idea. It used to be such, such a huge event. Yeah. Like, every year it was who made the McDonald's All-American game. Um, and we were talking, like, going back and looking at older ones. And I'm like, I remember Shaq's one. I just remember it being star-studded. And then going back and looking, it's like, yeah. oh, yeah. Uh, Shaq was in the game, and Allen Houston, and Kenny Anderson, and Bobby Hurley, and Jim Jackson, you know, all in one game out there on the court at the same time. It's like, oh, yeah, these guys uh, turned out to be uh, pretty damn good players. It's still it's pretty NBA. good, right? It's yeah. still, but it's not, you're right, I think it was more star-studded uh, back then. So I, I just randomly pulled up the 2000 roster. Okay. Um, Deshaun Stevenson. He was supposed to go there to you KU, go. right? I think he went right sure. to the Luke Ridnour, Oregon. Darius Miles, St. Louis kid. Chris Duhon, remember him? Uh, Brian Boddicker? How about that? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, he's that older than that. Okay. Yes. I mean, I didn't know he had eligibility left. <laughs> I think I remember left him. I think he was in Texas. <laughs> totally uh, remember. Ford, remember him? Jared Jeffries, Indiana, yeah. right? Yep, Indiana. Uh, Andre right. Brown. He played for a blue blood, did Jared Jeffries. Oh, I'd love to get in this conversation <laughs> if you want to continue it. Trayvon Bryant, Zach Randolph. Oh, Trayvon Bryant. Uh, yes. That's right. I remember him. Oh, yeah. Trayvon Eddie, Bryant. Maybe. Eddie Griffin, uh, Darius Rice. Yeah. Talik Brown, Omar Cook. Yeah, all those guys. The uh, Pulling up the uh, 1990 uh, oh, Khalid, Khalid Reeves. To hell with that guy. Let's go. Uh, uh, Arizona, Reeves, right? Uh, yep. Clifford Rozier. Um, uh, Eric Montross. Yeah. Grand Rest Hill. Rest in peace, right? He, yeah. he passed away recently. Grand Hill. Ed O'Bannon. Oh, oh, my God. Damon Bailey. Oh, my God. Sean Bradley. <laughs> Damon Bailey. He played for the Blue Bay. He was supposed to be the next schoolboy legend. Uh, and, that's right. And Bob Knight got a hold of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I love just like going back and looking at some of these uh, crazy, you know, games. Like, wow, all these dudes that played in that uh, in that game. Man. Well, and it's so it's so different now because there's so many more avenues to the NBA than there was right in 1990. Mm-hmm. But back then, it was you went to high school, then you went to college, then you went to the NBA, and then late 90s. Okay, you started to have more and more guys jumping directly to the NBA. You had more and more. Um, um, you know, Europeans come over and play. Yeah. And then nowadays you have the G League. You have that high school, you know, all these high school basketball factories. You have that one league that's not the G League. It's just there in Atlanta. And they get really good players <laughs> right. and they get drafted now. So it's harder to corral all the great players um, than it was back then when you just kind of had this one linear approach from high school to college to the NBA. How about this? In 91, the West squad ended up winning the game and you would hope – the West squad had uh, Glenn Robinson, had Michigan. Chris we- Weber, Jalen Rose, Juwan Howard. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, Glenn Robinson has Purdue. Sorry, I'm thinking Purdue. Glenn yeah, Rice. Yeah. Glenn no, Rice, no, gotcha. No, yep, yep, yep. yep. Okay, Glenn gotcha. Robinson, Purdue. And then um, Chris Weber, Jalen Rose, Juwan Howard, <laughs> Calvin Rayford uh, went <laughs> yeah. to KU, yeah. Cherokee Parks. Cherokee like, Parks, Duke. <laughs> how's that? T- they won by two. <laughs> two points. I don't think I ever knew Calvin Rayford was a uh, an all uh, yeah. all American. Yeah, uh, they won by two Wait, points. Were, uh, what, uh, was uh, what is the uh, King and Jackson? Were they on the uh, uh, the east see. side or the east? Or, uh, no, or Jimmy King was on the west as well. And 
Were they all five McDonald's All Americans? I thought they. They were, were all fabulous. But, yeah, they were all fabulous. I don't see Ray Jackson here. No. So uh, yeah, Ray Jackson was on the West as well. So you had four of the five in the Fab Five, and then. Glenn Robinson and Calvin Rayford and Cherokee Parks <laughs> throw in there. Uh, and they won by two. One by two against the team of uh, Travis Best, Corey Alexander, Keith Legree, okay. Eric Brunson, Ben Davis, uh, James Forrest, Donald Williams, Sharon Wright, Danielle Marshall, mm -hmm. and uh, Vaughn? David Vaughn. Yeah, so. <laughs> you caught it one time at Donnie and Danielle Marshall. That's right. And they weren't related. No, they were not. Um, you know, it's uh, Calhoun had a type. Yeah. <laughs> If you are a Don and a Marshall, I want you in. to play for me. Uh, UConn's a blue blood, right? Yes. Now, look. Okay, so it's usually by bitter <laughs> blue blood fans that don't like it, right? No, they're not. Blue blood. So blue blood, I looked up the definition, is Did you? Okay, of good. noble birth. Yeah, right, right. So if you want to apply that to him, like, you had to be good in the 40s and the 50s. And that's the, that's the uh, and criteria. Like, okay, well, if that's the case, then that term – means little to me now right if you mm -hmm. i mean there were a lot of i mean uh technically oklahoma state was a blue blood right i mean they won in I've 44 about, and 45 i've always thought of oklahoma state right? as a blue blood right. in basketball you know and if if you have to continue it then indiana is not a blue blood anymore agreed. at all sorry agreed first of all all the other teams are blue <laughs> isn't it weird that's except true. for indiana that's why AU, you know, that's... kentucky UCLA. I mean, UConn has to be UConn is some blue. form of yeah. blue. Duke, North Carolina. North Carolina. North Carolina. Uh, Michigan and State is green. Duke so. should not be a blue blood. Well, they were Duke only around since 80. Yeah, I mean, come on, That's man. not a blue blood then. <laughs> if you, okay, if we're going to apply these rules, Duke can't be one. Indiana can't be one. What about Duke Kane? Can they Definitely. be one? Yeah, yeah the I, Dukes I think. from uh, yeah. James Madison can be one. Duke is Duke. Duke is Duke. Um, uh, TV more than leave it. But uh, yeah, if they're reruns. not, then we're gonna, like you said, we're going to come up with a different uh, term that means a lot more than blue blood because uh, UConn is a powerhouse. Yeah, I mean, if if, if it's like and well, Villanova is, you know, who are the claim to? who are the program the prestigious programs in college basketball that like well UConn is certainly up there, but typically when we say that we conflate that with well yeah these are the blue bloods of college yeah. basketball but uconn is one championship it's two wins away from having more national titles than north carolina already more than ku right yeah because uh, they got five and they're about to have six that would be the tied for the third most with uh with north carolina yeah. indiana's got five i mean louisville con uh, considers themselves a blue blood and uh they've got three national championships in their history and they're all since what 99 UConn, yeah. Right? That was the exactly. first. Yeah. yeah. UConn in, in 25 years. And, like, UCLA is is a blue blood because they've got 11 championships. Are they still, though? Because they haven't won since 95, right? Agreed. It's been yeah. 30 years since they've won a championship, and 10 of their 11, which is amazing, but 10 of their 11 was came a small in, little like, window in, there. in 12 years. Yes. <laughs> you know, when uh, yeah, The tournament started as, like, the Elite Eight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You made a Final uh, Four? Yeah, we won a game. <laughs> I know. Why couldn't Missouri have done that? <laughs> right. Just one game, damn it. You made the tournament. You were in the Elite Eight. Come on. Oh, good night, man. Um, but glad to see Alabama made it. So good for them. And Clemson. Uh, was right there. I mean, they were close. Uh, they were. You, you, know you're, uh, you, you know you're new to basketball when they keep showing a fan in the stands that's going crazy when Clemson was scoring wearing a Clemson football jersey. <laughs> like, you couldn't find a basketball Nothing jersey won. or a T-shirt or something. Like, you had to wear a Clemson football jersey to the basketball game. I mean, come on. It's like the people yelling home of the Chiefs at Royals games. Like, <laughs> come on, man. Uh, you couldn't find a basketball jersey. There's plenty of other people there in the crowd that had basketball jerseys or basketball shirts, you know, for Clemson. But Is that Bama's first Final Four? Yeah. Clemson had made one before. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm happy for uh, Bama that they got to yeah, go to one. Going so, for them. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> you 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 have a downtrodden athletic program like that that Usually, doesn't have success. Like they're connected. It's like a yo-yo. The better your basketball program gets, the worse your football <laughs> program gets. Get ready, Bama. That's right. Oh my God. They would they would exchange every basketball win ever to be a football powerhouse. They don't they, care about the final disband, fours. Is cool. Disband it's, the program. Yeah. It's yeah. just an added little element. I used to joke about it like Alabama basketball was to pass time before spring football. <laughs> like. How do we entertain ourselves to get to spring football? <laughs> oh, well, Alabama, you know, Anthony Grant was there. Um, and um, you've got uh, North Carolina State this year with men's and women's mm. Final Fours. Yeah, that's cool. And it's like, okay, when has that happened? 
It's happened a lot more than you would think. Well, UConn won both. Yeah, and they can do it tonight. And as I believe well. they were the first in any level to do that since uh, uh, Central Missouri State did it. So right? didn't they do it in the uh, so here's here D two in the eighties or something like that? All of the um, women's and men's uh, to win the championship. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All of the women's and men's teams at the same time to make a Final Four. Georgia, the first one in eighty three. Duke in ninety nine. Oklahoma in two thousand two. Texas in two thousand three. UConn in two thousand four. Michigan State in 2005. And that was the year the women won it too, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. LSU in 2006. UConn in 2009. U- UConn in 2011. <laughs> Louisville in 2013. UConn in 2014. Jeez. Syracuse 2016. Sacramento 2017. NC State 2024. Maybe UConn 2024. Yeah. If the uh, women win tonight. But well, basically, anytime USC. like a men's team from, uh, you know, Tennessee or UConn <laughs> makes it, you would think. Probably but both are going to be in there. Tennessee's but not winning. And they haven't it's been crazy. to one. They've never been to a Final Four. They're like, the Missouri. men have they never been to a Final no, Four. No, they get to the Elite oh. Eight. The Elite Eight is the, the farthest they've ever advanced in the tournament. Uh, Missouri you know. loves company, though. That shoved the Mizzou yes. fans out there. Missouri does of, love company. <laughs> there, there's a lot of programs. Yes, did you do it on purpose? I did not. I did not. Missouri loves company. It's just a matter of how you pronounce the vowels and the guns and whatever. Um, but yeah, it's like UConn finally basketball. Can you just get to the final four in basketball? Because you're probably there with the women. <laughs> so, UConn one, two, three, already four times and could be five. Amazing. If uh, Paige Becker's uh, and UConn knock off Juju. That, that's and another USA great tonight. matchup. Uh, that KU game seeing I, uh, Juju play for the first time. Like, wow, dude, I can't. He's logo three in it too. I can't wait for tonight. You know, I'm I, I'm thankful for the rain. You know, I, second Temptations reference today, but the second Temptations uh, with the I uh, wish it would rain, you know, yeah. sunshine, blue skies, please go away. OK, because my son had baseball practice tonight mm. at 630. I just want to sit down and watch yeah. LSU, Iowa, and then UConn and USC. Yeah. Well, baseball practice has been canceled. So thank you, Rain. I appreciate you. Now, your kids, your down. kids are in, in a tough age for you I know. to still watch all the sports. Agreed. You do. Agreed, totally. But the rain helped me out for this one. You know, I've been waiting for this game, and Kim Mulkey said it, you know, what, yesterday, that this should be a Final Four game. And, yeah, I mean, uh, whether it should be or not, we right, get yeah. it. We get the matchup. I don't – I don't. that's like – Win more games, three seed. Yes, that's Win right. Win more games, you'd be exactly a one right. seed. Okay? You lost some games early on. Yeah. It's like, what is going on? You've got, you have got you have this uh, this powerhouse. you got these transfers. Go. Haley Van Lith comes in and uh, joins a national championship team. you got Angel uh, returning. I mean, you shouldn't be losing some games early. And then uh, this game tonight is going to be – one of, if not the most watched, women's basketball game in history. Yeah. I think it will be the most watched women's basketball game in history. Um, especially with the BS sort of painting of good versus evil, like that you know tool in the L.A. Times that presented UCLA versus LSU was good versus evil. The uh, dirty debutantes of LSU <laughs> versus the uh, – uh, well, the, they the, lean into the, that role. The, the, I mean, the, if you listen to their press conferences, they're they're leaning into that villain role. And I and I think they do because they've already been sort of pegged that way. So it's like, you know what? Bleep you. We'll be the villain if we got to be the villain. Um, and it's like, you know, can't believe Caitlin Clark said curse words and Angel Reese. They're talking smack to each other. It's like, yeah, they're athletes. I mean, that happens. Uh, and tonight's game should be uh, should be awesome. Should be a lot of fun. And then, of course. It, it shouldn't be viewed – like, it's appetizer and entree. It's like two entrees because UConn and USC yeah. should be an awesome because Juju uh, – that game, we were watching the UConn game versus uh, Illinois, mm-hmm. and on the side TV was Baylor-USC in the women's uh, uh, Elite Eight game. Uh, and um, – That, or, sweet uh, that 16. was Sweet 16, yeah. yeah, women's Sweet 16 game. And we're watching it, and UConn goes on that incredible run, 30 to nothing run. And we flipped it. <laughs> UConn went to the uh, to the side TV, and Baylor USC was on the uh, main TV, and <laughs> Juju was on her way to dropping thirty in the game, and she's you know fantastic to watch play. I'm like, this is the much more entertaining game than uh, UConn. The UConn Illinois game was entertaining because of just how amazing it was to watch a team go on a thirty to nothing run and have just an avalanche. I don't think I've ever seen that. I, I don't. I've never. Not at the level. I mean, even even if it's like. You know, some fall into a game, free but... throw or something. <laughs> right. You got Terrence Shannon on the floor. How does he <laughs> yeah. not have one bucket over, you know, an hour? It was like 52 minutes. Yes, there was a halftime mixed in. Uh, but it was 52 minutes without a point. Without a point, it was 23-23. The next thing you know, they were down 53 
to 23. If UConn was trailing 23 nothing, they still would have been up by seven. You know? <laughs> seven minutes later in basketball. It was one of the more impressive things I've, I've seen on a basketball court. Just everybody in there and just s- swarming Illinois. Didn't seem like they could do anything. Klingon, uh, Klingon. <laughs> Klingon. <laughs> well, maybe. I mean, Star Trek. Alien, yes. Kling Kong uh, and uh, up there just blocking everything and I love Brad Underwood was like, I don't care if he blocks 100 shots. We're going to go in there and go in there and go in there. I'm like, okay, almost well, got there. Well, he, he, he kind of did. I mean. It was funny. Uh, yesterday, the timeline was, um, and uh, mine was this way, and then Jake Kuda pointed out, it was like, <laughs> man, Zach Eady gets fouled every time down court. <laughs> Man, are they going to call anything on Zach Eady? He fouls every time down court, depending on your perspective on whether totally. he was getting hacked right. or he was the one doing the doing the foul. That's what I joked about. Is like Rick Barnes was like, well, it's tough to officiate Zach Eady. I'm like, I agree. Tennessee fouled him way more than they actually called. <laughs> what I think it's the uh, and then they're complaining about three seconds and well, he's in the lane too long. Three seconds. Well, he does post and repost and post and kick it out and then repost. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the highlights you'll see, like he's getting the ball outside the paint, like he's getting the ball thrown to him and he's outside the paint when he's getting the ball, but whatever, people can put a stopwatch on it and say uh, three seconds, but oh, dude, there know. was one time it was about 13 seconds yeah. <laughs> and like he had the ball and it was just, I'm like, you can, yeah. you can call it. I get it. When the, the shot goes up, you reset the three seconds. Right, people yeah. don't understand that, but I mean, he, he posted, kicked out. Reposted. Reposted, stayed in the whole time, got it, <laughs> dribbled several times, kind of looked, pivot. I'm like, yeah, just yeah. take it out of the game if you're not going to call it at I that point. I mean, I'm, I'm, or five seconds, whatever. Well, I love the, honestly, I love... the 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 shorter the shot clock gets, maybe the the more you have that conversation of yeah. like, okay, it's not a huge thing anymore. Guys posting out in the uh, in posting mm-hmm. in the lane just because you know we're hurrying these shots already. Yeah, um, these possessions already. But but I think uh, but, but I saw the uh, over the last four years. Um, the four games with the biggest foul differential in the tournament have all been Purdue games. Really? Yeah, like, what is it, 27 to 12 or whatever yesterday? Yeah. There, there have been three other games did like they, that. Did they win them all? Of, um, was, was one of them Fairly Dickinson? Is, but one was Fairly Dickinson. <laughs> that would have been amazing. They probably did not win them all. Um just because well, they, the <laughs> they don't win a whole lot of games. <laughs> it's the tournament. It's the tournament. It's the tournament. I mean, they flame uh, out. Uh, but, yeah, that's the, that's the Zach Eady effect. Yeah. And he's so big and strong to where like even just like a little bit of like if he just puts a elbow into a, a little bit you're going to be displaced as opposed yeah. to a lot of guys who have to extend right that arm and you see more of that displacement uh, him he just kind of just like moves and then <laughs> parts the defense like the red well, sea i don't think dj burns will be able to guard him but i think it's a collision course with uh yukon and purdue and you'll have seven three three hundred with ed seven, and seven two two eighty yeah. with Klingon. <laughs> I mean, just like okay, let's see, see what because both those guys dominated their game. Both those guys, uh, you know, UConn, uh, Klingon dominated that game with Tennessee uh, or with uh, with Illinois, and Edie was dominating the game. And Dalton Connect was right there with him. It's just you know didn't get any other help. Dalton Connect. I mean, he was the only guy that was scoring for them. Other guys missing shots. Uh, Zakai Ziegler was uh, had a rough game. Uh, and and couldn't come through when when he had open shots, and you know mm-hmm. that uh, that happens. You get one shot. You get we, one. Did we already eliminate the sound today? We have not done that. We have not. We're done gonna that. do that. Today? Yes, we are gonna do that. We'll take a timeout. We'll come back. We will get learn funniest best, and we will eliminate some uh, bracket of sound sound bites that lost over the weekend. More zone right after this.
I will continue right here on Sports Radio 810 WHB. Jason Anderson with you. Dylan Michaels. We're hanging out with Mick Schaefer, presented by Empower Payments. Heading up until 2 o'clock. Program with Seren Petro comes your way at 2 o'clock, and then at 6 o'clock tonight, we've got uh, LSU versus Iowa. And then UConn taking on USC with the uh, right to go to the Final Four with those four teams. Only two of them can head to the Final Four. Is that how it works? I looked it up this morning. Yeah. i got to go back Man, and check. Different rules in the men's and women's game. Somebody tweeted it out. I want to give them full credit for tweeting it out in case they were wrong, so I want them to be the ones that were wrong. You know what's, but uh, they said that uh, – you know what's dumb true. about the women's tournament besides having uh, a floor with uh, men's men's three point line on the one side and women's on the other? <laughs> what's that? Uh, it's not that they play home games. I get that the for, you earn a home game or your the first side mm-hmm. is on home home courts. It's that they have two regions, two regions, not four. So four teams advance to the final four from two locations. Oh, yeah, sweet. That's dumb. Yeah. It hasn't always been like that. Yes. Uh, Take them to four. That's right. Nice. Uh, yeah. Learn Funniest Best presented by Pyramid Roofing for a free estimate, 816-966-1101 or pyramidroofingkc.com. What I learned this weekend is, um, well, I, I, I think maybe my kids are watching too much of the NCAA tournament or maybe it's just on at all times in our house whenever it's on, uh, that uh, during the commercials. So they've got the, uh, I believe it's Nissan, the uh, mascot commercial. Mm-hmm. With the uh, song of uh, "Back Up," you'll know me like that. Yeah. Back up, back up, you'll know. So uh, that commercial plays all the time, right? So clearly, kids hear things; they pick up on things. Uh, and uh, my son and daughter were playing, and Everett apparently was bothering Juliet, and she said, "Everett, back up! You don't know me <laughs> like that." <laughs> and I just lost it, <laughs> like. Really? <laughs> You'll know me like that. <laughs> like, all right. Well, apparently they've been watching the commercials too. Uh, but, uh, that's but yeah, that's good. going on in our house. So apparently now back and forth, they just go back up. You'll know me like that. <laughs> at least at least they're not singing the Chet Holmgren, Shay Alexander, uh, Gildas Alexander song. Okay. It's, that's oh my, the worst commercial oh, I've ever seen. Oh, my God. I hate it. It's so, so terrible. People actually came up with that idea. They Then they... Had them do it, and they're like, "Yeah, we're gonna and they ag- keep this idea going. We're gonna and they we're gonna to execute it. it. Yeah, lots what of a, people were involved. What in a letting pro that happen. wants. Hey, should we sing? Like, what a pro wants. Oh. What a pro needs. Oh. oh, and then we'll make fun of how bad it was. We're like, oh, it was a little, a little off key, a little flat, but we'll get better. It's wow. so bad. It's so, so bad. bad. Yeah, and I, I don't even know what it's for. <laughs> like, I don't even know what the commercial was. It's just like I, I, I they're, they're singing, and I want them. To, to not do Is it, it anymore. Is a car as well? I don't know. No, it's a pro. Pro something, you know. <sighs> not a girl, but a pro. I think it's AT&T, right? Sure. Sure. I'll take yeah. your word for it. It yeah. could be Nissan, too. I don't could know. Be. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. I think uh, uh, Chet or Shay should have looked at the other ones and back up. You don't know me like that. We're not singing together. What did you learn from the weekend, Mick? So I learned this, and I might be late to the party because I brought it up to a couple people already. I, 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 I focus group my learn funniest best <laughs> a lot of times, and they knew it already. But I'm going to stick with it because maybe you guys don't know. Um, but you know Alanis Morissette's song, You Ought to Know? Like her biggest hit, maybe. Is it irony that I don't know? I don't know. I don't know. You ought to know. I don't know what It was this is. maybe that or irony off Jagged Little Pill. Yeah. You, you ought to know. Um, what a pro. <laughs> you know who that's about? Y- y- you? No, she's singing about a guy in a breakup she had. Who's it about? Dave Coulier. <laughs> really? <laughs> From Full House. What? Uncle Joey. <laughs> they dated wow. when he was 33 and she was 18. What? It's supposedly that song's about her when she sings, or about him, when she sings, I hate to bug you and I met a love dinner. That song? That, yeah, that, yeah. That right, line? right, right. Bob Saget, like, like it is like he's like no we were we were at dinner, I can uh, I can confirm and she called him and he's like yeah hey, I'm sorry you're bugging me in the middle of dinner <laughs> he said oh, shut up and uh, it's a line in the song now so um, yeah I, I'm glad you guys hadn't heard that as well uh, I hate I hate when you always tell me to cut it out that's what I was gonna get to <laughs> 33 dating 18 you need to cut that out cut, cut it, it out. out. Hey, everybody. I mean, oh, stop, please. Cut it out. 
<laughs> no idea. Yeah. Uh, well, and he's known for not working blue. He's a very, you know, uh, a very um, just uncuss in his in his sets. But he do some other stuff. Apparently, dating an eighteen well, year old. I guess there's he's, always a vice somewhere. Uh, Dylan, what uh, what did you learn? Uh, so I learned that Clark Hunt had no idea what a no look pass in football was. He had to be shown this by Brett Veach. He told this story on the Kevin Clark show. Um, it is a great podcast with Omaha Productions. Little minute story here. His rookie year, when he was a backup, right. he sat behind Alex Smith. Um, uh, Brett Veach would periodically send me clips of Patrick in practice. Right. Uh, including no look passes, and, and I had to call Patrick. I had to call Brett and say, what, "What's a no look pass? I mean, I, I know what it is in basketball, but it, it doesn't really exist in football." He's like, "Yeah, it does. Watch the clip." And sure enough, in practice, he'd be looking this way and throwing throw that way. And of course, when he started playing uh, the next season, uh, that's that's exactly what we saw from him. Uh, I remember the beginning of that 2018 season. Uh, we went to Pittsburgh. Uh, a place where we had lost so many games, usually by d double digits uh, when we went up there. And uh, Patrick goes up there and, and throws for three or four touchdowns. We absolutely light them up. Uh, then the next week, uh, we're, we're out playing uh, the Chargers, and he has another big game. And it was sort of at that moment that I, I knew he was going to be pretty special. So the question was, obviously, at the end there, when did you know Patrick Mahomes was yeah. going to be special? I just thought it was funny that – what what else a, could the no look? Pass, what's a no, no look, look pass? pass be? I know well, what a no look yeah, pass is. Yeah, at least in basketball. at least he knew that part. Um, I don't think I had seen it. I'm sure guys were doing it before Patrick Mahomes, but I don't think I'd seen it in a game. Had you? I think no they they've pass? shown some clips of like um, you know the people that don't like hearing about Patrick Mahomes are like oh he's never done it. look at it. and they show like a clip of Matt, Matt Stafford. Stafford. That uh, that was what I was gonna say. Doing so it. They, yeah. The people that didn't like hearing about it. I, yeah. I thought I had heard a lot like, of guys oh, do it, did it in practice all the time, yeah. but none of them had Correct. the uh, intestinal fortitude to bring yeah. it out in games. Oh, Mahomes invented this, except for Matt Stafford uh, did it. Hate to, Imagine if Mahomes did this. Uh, be talking about it for a week. Hate to throw a flag on uh, Clark Hunt there, but uh, the Chargers game that year was the first it game. It was the first game. And the next game was the Steelers, where he didn't throw for three or four. He almost threw for three plus four. He threw for yeah. six touchdown yeah. passes. And then and ten after those those first two games. And then it was home for San Francisco when he had the running around and then hitting that was game uh, three, yes. Connolly in the back yes. of the end zone. And then game four was at the Jags where No, Denver and then Jags. Oh yeah, Denver Monday yeah. Night Football and then Jags because that Jags was when the, they were laughing, right? They were laughing Who was about the one that, that linebacker? Tevin Smith. Yeah. And he was like, I'll, I'll, I'll tell, tell you after afterward. the game. I'll tell you after, after the game. game. Yeah. And they asked him, like, no. And we're still waiting. Yeah. Still waiting. Still waiting. Uh all right, funniest for you, Mick. But it's for me. I uh, just said this is. Uh, I haven't seen it in a few days, but apparently on Friday I was I was laughing at it. This is one of those uh, TikTok videos where the guy dresses. It's one guy, but he dresses up in two different outfits, and he's looking one way, and then look back in the other way, like he's having a conversation with himself. Himself. This is uh, this is uh, the NFL banning the hip drop tackle. His. Tackle. All right, everyone, listen up. This is a big change. We're banning the hip drop tackle. Uh. Okay. What exactly is a hip drop tackle? Glad you asked. Do you want the full definition or the simple one? Let's start with the full one. Great. The hip drop tackle is defined as a tackle where the defender wraps one or both arms around a player, turns his body with a twisting or rotating motion, and subsequently lands on that player's lower extremities. Okay, and the simple definition? Sure. In layman's terms, it's any tackle. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, why are you doing this? Well, it's all about player safety. This type of tackle is resulting in a disproportionate number of injuries, including to some of our biggest stars like Tony Pollard and Mark Andrews. Well, yeah, those injuries suck, but they kind of just seem like normal tackles. I mean, this is a contact sport after all. Not for long. What was that? No. Look, we appreciate the input, but this is the direction we're going. You do realize that tackles like this are only happening more often because players are adapting to your other rules that don't allow them to hit too high or too low, so they're just aiming for the middle and dragging guys down. Not sure what you're getting at. What I'm getting at is I'm not sure what you want defenders to do anymore. We trust they'll figure it out, but don't worry. These rules won't be around forever anyway. What do you mean? Well, we're actively working on a new system that should eliminate these problems altogether. We're calling it the Fabric Retrieval, Low Impact, Abandon All Contact Game System. Flag football? <laughs> You're talking about flag football. Offense go bird. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, they spell it out. They put the words flag on the screen, flag. Football. You see that yet? That's pretty good. Uh, what was the, uh, <laughs> Not for long. the layman's terms, tackle? Any tackle. <laughs> that's it dylan the uh funniest for you uh so i sent this to you guys in the uh group chat and i'll do a little retweet here because it's kind of hard to do a visual medium oh yeah uh, here sure. but in the scottish 
soccer league, and I have yet to show this to Nate or Jake to see if this has ever happened before. They were taking a free kick. Uh, the gentleman proceeds to hit the soccer ball off one <laughs> player's head, and it ricochets and hits another player in the head, and both are on the ground. Obviously had about a five- to ten-minute stoppage for the injuries. And they're I'm on sure. his team, right? They are on his team, yes. It's, <laughs> right. it's, I almost had to like do research to make sure this wasn't AI generated. I, that's what I thought, too. Right, because you always see some of those now. And but the guy it, who did it's a really good player, right? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Um, but if you watch closely, <laughs> it hits him so a amazing. third time. The ball hits the guy on the ground oh, it a does. third time. It does. It's, it's an all-time clip. I didn't even... Think it was real. So. Well, yeah, you saw the old, the one clip where the 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 guy is stopping all the penalty <laughs> kicks, right? And he yeah. ends up being what I hauled off to the hospital. Yes. He blocks another one while he's yeah. on the stretcher. That is why I had to like check because it reminded I'd me of that. It. Yeah, that is brilliant. Is what that is. Um, my uh, my funniest from the weekend is during the uh, NC State and Duke game in the uh, second half. Uh, they teed up Kevin Keats for NC State, and uh, they showed. Um, a, a close-up of Keats yes, on the sideline, and as he's looking at the official and he walks, and as he walks, it clears the path behind him to see a little kid who is giving the ref the uh, one-finger salute. It, the kid's like nine. <laughs> he's like nine, <laughs> blonde, bushy hair, and just holding up his fist with one finger. It's just great that, <laughs> that, that Keats – Moves out of right frame there, yeah. and it's just well, right as and he reveals this kid. And the know, kid was just like, holding it too. He was, he was just, holding that pose. He was so mad. And by the way, they were up twelve. Yeah, they were up twelve they were. with three minutes to play, and this kid is still flipping off the ref. Uh, what a good kid, uh, Dylan. <laughs> good fan. Oh, yeah, absolutely, good, man. Good parenting. That's when the kid was like, "Back up, ref. You don't know me like <laughs> you that. You don't know me like that." What was the uh, best for you, Dylan? Uh, best from earlier, Zach Eady cutting the net down without a ladder. It's all time. That's pretty good. Man. Uh, that was really good. My best is actually sort of a worst, but it's best that, you know, more exposure for it uh, in uh, women's college basketball and the officiating that's going on in women's college basketball. Uh, Vic Schaefer said it yesterday. Who? That, uh, Vic Schaefer. Who? Uh, Vic Schaefer. Okay. V. Uh, Vic, Schaefer, v wrong for too, victory, except for that one. Close enough. Um, but, uh, I asked him a question at the Big 12. Trip. That's right. That's right. You told me that. Uh, Mick hey, Schaefer. Vic, Mick Schaefer. Yes. He had a moment. Yeah, he's like, wait a minute, Mick and Vic? Wow, we should be brothers. Uh, but he said yesterday, he's like, you know what uh, people say, you know, only in women's college basketball could, could that happen. Uh, there is uh, There have been three issues that have taken place. Earlier in the tournament, a ref was removed at halftime of a women's college basketball game, NC State, against Chattanooga because uh, the ref found out, uh, uh, graduated from Chattanooga. So they removed the ref. It would have been an, sort of an easy thing to... He just remembered uh, at that it, point. It was uh, she. Like, uh, they found out. <laughs> like, it would have been an easy thing for, like, the head of officials to be like, yeah. hey, uh, where do you guys graduate from? Let's not put you in these games for the uh, yeah. NCAA tournament. Uh, then... So uh, two of these have happened with NC State. Yeah, exactly. Then Notre Dame and uh, Hannah Hidalgo, in the middle of the game, she was wearing a nose ring, and they had to stop the game to take it out. It's the only time this year she's been asked to remove the nose ring. <laughs> but it's like, well, you can't wear jewelry. What about before the game then? Why halfway through the game they just decided? So she's over there in pain. Wait, they're a, trying. To <laughs> that's a rule. Nobody should. Nobody wears Agreed. jewelry. Agreed. But then it's like arbitrarily or saying do they, they don't. Do they wear ear, are earrings allowed no in idea. women's side? Okay. No idea. I know there's. I've seen. I've seen like boys' high school games with the kids. Yeah, <laughs> they had to take their uh, earring uh, out. Right. Take the chain off and yeah. all that. But it's like all year long it hasn't been enforced, and then randomly in like yeah. the second quarter, like oh by the way you need to take that out. Like beforehand you didn't want to get around to that. Well, some of the times you can't. They're really small little studs. Right. You can't tell them. Is that snot? I don't know. And then yesterday they played on a court that had two That's different the, three point line man. distances. Um, <laughs> and uh, both teams before the game agreed to play on the. Um, the uh, asymmetrical court <laughs> at the three-point line. Well, I mean, men's and women's games are pretty, pretty even with shooters, and a lot of times the yeah. the women have have, have more uh, uh, better better shooters, uh, yeah. gunners. That I mean, that I've never seen more logo threes than I've seen in uh, women's college basketball this year. I just don't know what they would have done if it went to overtime, I, because they agreed to it because it would be an even advantage for both teams. Yeah. Unless you go to overtime, yeah. <laughs> and then there's a five minute just uneven a half court advantage. Game. <laughs> just a yeah. half court game. Although, and I don't know. <laughs> I mean, make it, take it, half court. I, I ones don't and know twos. if it's uh, an even advantage because if you have That's that true. men's line in the second half, yeah. and you're needing to make some big threes That's and slow the game down, get more possessions, and you're taking more shots there, bigger shots, more clutch shots. 
I, I think yeah. that's an advantage for the team that uh, they had in the first half. Yeah. They could have called Kyle Shanahan to figure out, you know, which side they. Honestly, it's a is it a foot difference? Uh, honestly, huh. if, if any, if your lead foot, if, any, if the women playing that game, if your any part of your lead foot was on that line, I feel like you could have <laughs> called it a three because it would have been a three. That's yeah. fine. Uh, what was the best for you, Mick? The best for me was I don't want to hear any of this crap anymore about Missouri not making a Final Four because they just made their second straight Final Four in chess. Take that. And they Boom. won it all, baby. They are your national champions in chess. <laughs> Look at those athletes right there. Damn right. You know what? Final Four. Of course they've made Final Fours. You know what that athletic department's okay. doing? Playing chess, not checkers. That's what they're playing. Don't need that uh, Final Four. You know what? Basketball is just a pawn in the big, grand athletic scheme of things. That is such a rook thing to say.
date being set. Now, we didn't get a chance to do that in the South and Midwest, which was the um, wrong mother bleeper region mm-hmm. and the Angan Briscoe with an E region. So let's get to our uh, at least our Elite Eight matchups in those regions. Let's start with the South, the wrong mother bleeper region. Uh, the one seed Houston took on the four seed Duke. Houston lost. The one seed is out, and so is this sound. I'm here all day. 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 You want the wrong mother? 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 That's uh, that was in the region was named wrong mother bleeper region. Um, so uh, it just randomly ended up in that uh, region. Um, Marquette. Ends up losing to NC State. And Marquette, the two seed in the wrong mother bleeper region, is out. And so is this sound. Hey, so I got good church right bunch. F, shuttle, Tom and Jerry right yellow. Orange, 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 let's go. Lining up in the clock at 10 seconds and ticking. Set. We're good, we're good. Set. Low snap. He runs and he throws. Caught touchdown. It's caught. Hartman caught the ball. The Chiefs have won. The Chiefs have won. The entire bench of these chasing Mahomes in the end zone. Patrick hey, Mahomes. Can I tell a quick funny story? Please. <laughs> I threw a touchdown to this dude at the end of the game. And he looked at me. I said, and he had no idea. I said, dude, we just won the Super Bowl. And he, he, he blacked out. He had no idea. I was like, bro, because like, he, he didn't even celebrate at the beginning. I'm like, what are we doing? Hey, well, I see you were talking about, okay, yeah, uh, it's time to celebrate now. So, hey. Did, you seriously did not know the game? I, I blacked out. I literally blacked out. I swear to God, I blacked out. Okay. But right. I'm glad this man was running towards me, though. <laughs> it get me back to life. But what is up? I got you. I don't know. I'm like, oh. That's crazy. Well, hey, so, once again, what's the name of this play? Um, Tom and Jerry. Uh, yeah, Tom and Jerry is the name of the play. We can guess who's who. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, the, same, the same motion, though. The same motion as we scored Corn Dog, and we scored a couple plays last year. So, uh, we saved it for the right moment. Tiger 12. So, that puts McColl in. Tom and Jerry right. And... It's gun trips right bunch, F shuttle, and that gives you a little corn dog with some, what? Let some me ask you this. Wait, wait, wait. Y'all hear this? We've been fighting for all night, all day. How about a little Viva Las Vegas? Viva Las Vegas! Viva! Viva Las Vegas! <laughs> Hey, Elvis never had it better than that right there. Let me tell you. So there you go. Marquette is out. Little Tom and Jerry uh, gives you some uh, corn dogs with uh, corn dog with a little mustard and ketchup. The on 49ers it. actually told McColl, like, we get the ball back. That's why. <laughs> they actually thought they did. Yes. All right. So you got a possession. We got a possession. Yeah. Now it's uh, what? Sudden yeah, death. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Uh, all right. We head to the uh, Angan Briscoe with an E region. And uh, Purdue advanced over. Gonzaga, so Gonzaga is out, and that means, unfortunately, we lost this sound. Sport, uh, the uh, rough times that you have with sport, everybody has it. Everybody, you can't really play unless you have some hard times. Uh, but it is the absolute glory hole. But I went back to work, got up on Monday morning, and there it was, glory hole. Uh, I think that's a part of leadership is to have some of the guys that have gone before that uh, – have been disappointed uh, to share it with everybody involved. For me, it's a reminder. I, too, have been here 23 years. And uh, it is a reminder. I've been here when it was glory hole days, and I've been here when it wasn't. And so having said that, uh, uh, I want me some glory hole. Oh, boy. So I have that perspective. So Jerry Jones has that perspective. Somebody That's- needs to tell him. It's, a, it's maybe an oil term. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Creighton ends up losing to Tennessee, and that means uh, Creighton is gone, and so is this sound. 
How many times have you told me, oh, you're stupid if you go to a bowl I game? I would never bowl call you stupid. Bowl games are worthless. I never called that, you stupid. Because that's where you come from, this, no. so you think that you don't, don't need to value this. Call, because you I are would, an elitist football <laughs> fan, that, that your team goes to a bowl game every year, and so you've lost the excitement. I don't have. get mad at me, because you don't, me. your little pee-pee doesn't get hard <laughs> if you go to a bowl game anymore. I've never, you don't care. I've never called you we stupid. We care. I've never, Nate's excited. Yeah. I'm excited. You're not excited, because it's like, you know. I've never called you stupid. You said if I go to a bowl game, I'm stupid. No, I said if you take four. And then he said you had a little pee pee, and it's not excited. <laughs> 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 And Creighton is out. So there you go. We will uh, we'll get teams to the Final Four uh, coming up this week as well. Uh, but tonight at 6 o'clock, it'll start back-to-back games where we will find out who is going to be heading to the Final Four on the women's side with uh, LSU and Iowa. You can hear it right here on Sports Radio 810 WHB, followed by UConn and USC. So. I hadn't read that trash. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I write something on the website, I'm like, uh, hey, did you check out my blog on 810 WHB? I hadn't read that trash. <laughs> oh. Thanks, Kim. I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing. I didn't write for the Washington Post. It was the blog <laughs> on 810. We're talking about that, right? You know that's what I'm talking about. I hadn't read that trash. Okay. Well, good to know. What about when somebody uh, transcribes the show? <laughs> have, I hadn't read that trash. Okay. Well, that's probably more appropriate. So, appreciate it. Thank you, Mick. What about a web article I wrote yesterday for KSHB.com? I hadn't read that oh, trash. Gotcha. Okay. Oh. Thought she was going to go. I liked it. <laughs> I hadn't read that trash. <laughs>